two cores or hardware threads is really important. So we needed some functionality for that, um, that we use daily. Um, and since we do a lot of low level research when it comes to um, interaction between hardware and software, we need an easy to use hardware performance measurement tool um, that we can run and get some basic uh, metrics out of that, some derived metrics. Uh, then for benchmarking um, and for research, we need to uh, additional tools like runtime system cleanup. Um, we wanna have a clean system before we start benchmarking runs. Then we wanna adapt the system like changing the CPU frequencies or uh, turning on and off of uh, CPU prefetches. Um, and for, for really low level stuff, we do micro benchmarking with assembly benchmarks. Um, and that's all part of the liquid tool suite. So what is liquid? Um, tool set performance oriented developers and users. Um, it's using the Unix philosophy to have single tools which do a single task and not like one basic um, executable, which does everything. So we have um, different tools for these different tasks like system topology and, and thread pinning and changing, uh, getting the energy consumption and so on. So here's the complete list. Um, so um, the, the tools are named pretty uh, intuitive. So liquid topology reads out the topology and prints it in a common way. Um, I will show an example in the, on the next slides. Um, then liquid pin to pin the application threads to hardware threads, uh, liquid perf counter to do hardware performance measurements, uh, liquid power meter to get the energy consumption. You can also use liquid perf counter for that, but liquid power meter is like more handy interface. And then for more the, the benchmarking purposes, we have liquid mem sweeper to clean up the file system cache and the last level cache. I'm sorry. Um, then we have liquid set frequencies, which manipulates the CPU and encore frequencies of um, currently x86 systems. Um, we are working to support other architectures as well for that. Um, liquid features to manipulate hardware settings, mainly the prefetches, but there are some different values you can change um, that uh, affects the, the runs. Um, and then we have liquid bench, which uh, is a micro benchmarking tool using a handcrafted and optimized assembly kernels um, to get like the best performance out of it, of, of a system um, to measure like the me memory bandwidth or cache bandwidth or uh, cycles for single instructions and stuff like that. So let's step in into, uh, directly. Um, so for liquid topology, um, what we basically need is like, what is that system? Um, so that's the CPU name, that's the official brand name um, used by Intel. That's the, the main workhorse pause of our computing center, the, the Megi cluster, that's one of those nodes here. Um, it's, it's an Intel Xeon Broadwell um, processor, um, server class, so this ENEPEX is server class. And it's a pretty early CPU setting, uh, stepping. So um, we, we had bugs on these nodes and that's mainly because of the, the early CPU stepping. Um, if with higher stepping, you normally have less bugs in the, in the hardware. Um, then you get a um, short overview um, how the system is um, assembled. So we have two CPU sockets, 10 cores per socket and one threads per core. So we have no SMT enabled on the compute nodes. Um, then you get a whole list. Um, I shorted it uh, because it's, it's quite long otherwise. Um, so you get for each hardware thread. So for each ID in the, that the system uses, you get the exact location. Is it an SMT thread? Is it not an SMT thread? Which core it is, which socket it is and whether it's available in your CPU set. So whether it's usable for you or your calculations or not. Um, if you're in a shared um, usage system, it might be that you share the node with a different user and then you get only a specific amount of cores while the other user gets the other ones. 
Um, and of course, you, do, you are only allowed to, to use those. That's why you have this availability column. Um, then you see all the, the CPU IDs um, on the two sockets. So socket zero uses the ID zero to nine and socket one then 10 to 19. Um, if you have F SMT enabled, um, it's, it's doubled and the, the, um, you normally have like first physical thread and then the SMT thread. So it would be something like three, zero, 20, one, 21 and so on. Um, afterwards, you get an overview about the cache topology. So how many cache levels there are and which cores share these. So for the level one cache, it's a 32 kilobyte cache. And each of these hardware threads has a distinct level one cache. Same for the 256 kilobyte big L2 cache. Um, the L3 cache is 25 megabyte and is shared by all hardware threads on a socket. So this gives, gives you like information how much um, data you can use in a, in a cache before someone else is riding on it. So if you have SMT enabled, these 32 kilobytes would fit for two hardware threads. So only, uh, so basically each hardware thread only has 16 kilobytes available. So it gives a, gives a nice overview um, about the caching topology. And in the end, we have the NUMA topology. So the memory topology of the system um, on these Broadwell nodes, it's pretty simple. Um, they have two memory, uh, two NUMA domains similar to the CPU sockets, um, same cores and so on. And you see how much memory is free and so on. There are new features like cluster on die or SNC or NPS, however the vendor calls them. And those um, split up the NUMA domains. So you would have two NUMA domains per socket. Um, and then you would see that here in the, in the output um, and can use it for further um, actions on the system like pinning and so on. So why, why do we stress pinning so much? So how we, why don't, do I talk about that so much? The, in, in HPC, the OS, so operating system task scheduler sometimes is no help for us um, because it, it places the, the threads and the processes on these hardware threads and tries to move them around from time to time. Um, there are reasons behind that why the task schedule do that. Um, one thing is like overheating of single hardware threads, um, but it all. But for us who, who want to have a specific execution um, of the application, um, it causes problems like cache trashing. So we loaded every data we need to the L1 cache, then we move the application to a different processor, and we have to reload everything into L1 again. So that's cache trashing. We, we load everything and then we, we trash it by, by moving the consumer away. Um, also, the, the inter-thread communication latency uh, can change. So if the operating task scheduler moves it to a completely different CPU socket, you have uh, much higher um, communication latencies and, and lower bandwidths. Um, and this might affect the, the execution. Um, so yeah. So if we don't pin, uh, we get pictures like that. That's the stream benchmark on the uh, Maggie nodes um, without any pinning. Um, and there you see like we have a huge variation. So the lines are from max to min, and then we have the 25 percentile and uh, 75 percentile and the line is like the average or the mean, the mean, probably the, the mean. Um, and we see we have, uh, high variation. Um, the system provides a bandwidth of 100 gigabytes per second. So only in a few cases, we really reach these um, high bandwidth. And um, if we control the affinity, so we pin our threads to specific CPU cores, we get pictures like that. Um, and this is like the default picture for saturating a shared resource on a computing system. So at some point we have reached enough threads um, to saturate the memory bandwidth in this case. Um, and then despite adding more threads, um, we cannot achieve a higher, higher bandwidth than that. But also this plot also contains the error bars. 
um, and you don't see them anymore because by uh, caused by the pinning, the the fluctuation between the runs is so minimal that you, that it's not visible in this picture anymore. So what we do, what we mean with affinity control is we reduce the set of possible hardware threads where the application can run on, and we force the the tasks of an application to stay on distinct hardware threads. Um, I will come to that in a, on the next slide. Um, so there exist many tools for limiting the set of, of hardware threads available to an application, famous as task set or NUMA CTL, but they don't pin. They just say the application can only run on cores like zero to three, but the OS task scheduler can still move the threads around, the application threads around in this set. Um, yeah, which still causes, can cause problems. So liquid pin is basically a task set. Um, additional, uh, additionally, we force the tasks on this dis distinct hardware threads. <coughs> Sorry. So if we look at the command, so liquid pin minus C zero to two, you can also use commas for separation um, if you want, and then the executable. Um, at first, it limits the set of hardware threads to zero to two. So the application thread uh, application can only run on those cores. And as soon as a thread is started by the application, um, the, the main task is pinned to the first CPU in the set, so the zero. Um, and then the application further, the additionally started hardware uh, application threads are pinned to the next hardware thread in the set uh, in a round robin fashion. So Thread one is the thread zero is the master gets pinned to zero. Thread one is, um, gets uh, pinned to CPU one, um, and the the last thread gets pinned to CPU two. If we our application starts more th threads than this, um, we do a round robin mechanism. So we start at zero again, um, and um, pin the threads to the the same cores. Um, we have tested it. It it worked with. Most of the threading solutions we have tried, so pthreads, OpenMP, only also the star PU um, you had in the uh, in the morning, the the, the bigger session. Um, we also tested this one, but also like Silk Plus and thread building blocks and whatever it is. Um, so I have I have only found a few threading solutions, mainly user space threading um, solutions that don't work with this um, program. So um, this is easy. So we want to have like distinct cores, um, but what can we do uh, if we want to pin to some um, some more complicated um, cases? Like we want to have one thread per CPU socket, and basically we don't want to care about the system we run on. We know exactly that. Um, we always want to have three or four uh, threads per socket. Then we can write the pinning string once and reuse it on every system. And Liquid is taking care about it. Um, for MPI run, um, there exists a separate tool which is called Liquid MPI run. Uh, I don't cover that here in the talk, um, but it's basically the same thing. So you do Liquid MPI run minus NP, tell how many uh, MPI processes you want. And it prints it directly. Um, you can also specify like a separate pinning, like I want to have two MPI processes per socket. And each of those MPI processes starts like five open MP threads. So this is all possible. Um, the liquid MPI run is, uh, is highly, let's say, cluster specific. So the problem is that every center runs like a different slurm configuration or uses torque instead of slurm or um, yeah so it, it can cause problems um, I tested on on our system and at the RTH in Aachen um, and on these two systems I know that it works before a publisher release but afterwards um, I have been on, on systems which didn't work at all so it is uh, dependent on the system. Um, and I have to rework this tool, so a little bit, but uh, so liquid MPI run is, is basically what it is used for. 
um, for pinning and later also for hardware performance measurements. I will come to that. So if we need more complicated cases, um, we can use the so-called affinity domains, which are defined by liquid. Um, so uh, the N, the node domain um, is, al is always there. Um, so each, uh, it, it contains all CPU cores of the system. Then we have two domains S0, S1 um, for the sockets. So this it contains only the CPUs of the socket. C0, C1 is the last level cache. I have a, ah, here it is. Okay, I, that's wrong animation um, order, but yes. Um, C for last level cache and M for the NUMA domains. On here, on these systems, it's quite useless because all, most of the domains look the same. So the socket, cache, and memory domains look exactly the same. But as soon as you are on other systems which have much a more complicated uh, system topology, um, current current uh, comment would be like the A64FX uh, on Fugaku. They have a completely different um, system topology um, with a huge amount of memory domains for a single socket. <clears throat> um, so if we want to use that, we can do a liquid pin minus C and then like the M1 domain. So the second NUMA domain, zero to three, and it will use like these numbers, so CU23 as indices in these lists. So it's like uh, the first four indices. So we have 10 to 30. Um, and with minus P, you can get the, the, the list out of it instead of using an, an application. Um, if we want to combine that, um, like if you want to have two, uh, four threads per memory domain, um, then we can do combine that with an add. Um, and then we get like exactly the list that we want to use it, want to use. If you now change to a different system, um, which at least has four cores per memory domain, you can use this pinning string um, and liquid will select the proper CPU cores under the hood. So you don't have to care about it anymore. Um, yeah. When you run it, it basically looks like this. It, the, the wrapper, so we start a wrapper um, around thread creation, and that's like the red color um, printing. Um, it tells us that the main thread will be pinned to zero. Um, so thread zero in this case, um, and the other one to, to, zero, uh, to one. And here we also see like um, we, we, we pin the, the core to 11, and then we have in the end like we are running on the cores 10 and 11. That's exactly the first two cores of memory domain one. Um, just we, as we, we said, liquid should do it. So let me see this. I think uh, someone else is asking in the chat. Um, So the MPI processes can move around if they are not pinned properly. The OS task scheduler can also move them around. Um, with liquid MPI run, they are pinned similar to the threads and, and cannot move away from their uh, distinct cores. So uh, we see uh, uh, an increasing complexity of applications. So we have more abstraction layers introduced. It's like the, the task of a computer scientist. Um, so that's what they are like learning at the university, build abstraction layers. Um, but these abstraction layers, um, so I'm a computer scientist too, so I can say that. Um, these abstraction layers cause, of course, like overhead um, to the application and to the hardware. So we have like, we have to resolve some pointers and, and stuff like that. It's all not needed basically by the application. If you would uh, program the application just for this pro, um, uh, system, um, we wouldn't need these application, uh, these abstraction layers, but we add them for um, simplicity of porting our application to different operating system and backends. Um, so yeah, they have their use case, but of course they, they add overhead. 
Um, so what we need, basically, we want to know what is the hardware actually doing uh, under the hood, despite how the uh, application looks like and how many abstraction layers are in between. So um, there is only one possibility, um, and that's hardware performance counters. They run side by side with the application and don't cause any overhead. Um, so no overhead is maybe like um, too strict. There might be some overhead. Um, I heard from Intel that there are some events who might uh, affect the execution, but uh, I don't know which one, and I have were not was not able to measure any of those. Um, yeah. Um, there are configurable events at different um, units in the system, and a unit is like the memory controller or the socket interconnect on one side of the CPU socket or one part of the L3 cache segments or whatever. So they are pretty scattered all over the hardware. And each unit provides a set of, set of counters, commonly four to six. Um, some of them are freely configurable. Some of them provide a fixed event, um, like instructions retired. Uh, is, is a fixed event on most um, systems. So there you can see how, how many instructions have been executed by my application. Um, you can use different measurement modes. Of course, you can do like a start to end measurement where you start the threads, uh, the, the, the counters, then run your application till the end, stop the counters and read them. Um, but also you can do some time-based sampling um, there's even event-based sampling, so reacting like I want to have a sample every one million uh, instruction um, executed, stuff like that. Um, there's a status scope possibility that so that the application must not be owned by you. So the hardware counter simply count whatever is happening on the CPU. Doesn't matter whether that's your application or a system daemon or whatever. Um, and of course, since you can uh, start and stop the measurements on the fly and, and read them whenever you want, um, you can do code instrumentation with it. Um, in, on the liquid side, it's called marker API. Um, and uh, we'll come to that. So, but um, it's used for code instrumentation um, also by other tools like Puppy and, and so on. <coughs> so how you use liquid perf counter, um, uh, you use a minor C, um, there's a minor and a capital C with different meaning. Um, the minor C is measure only on these hardware threads, don't care where the application is. So the application um, can run anywhere on the system. You can pin it, of course, um, but it, it's just measuring on these cores. So when the application is moved to a different hardware thread, it is not counted anymore. Um, with a capital C, it means measure on these cores and pin the application to the hardware thread. So always use a capital C if, if you're in doubt. Um, minor C is rarely used. Um, I use it sometimes, but it's rarely used. Then you can specify the CPU selection. That's the same thing like for liquid pin. It uses the same syntax for all liquid tools. Um, so you can also use these memory domains or, or socket domains and um, combine them with an add and so on. And then we have a minus G for the group. Um, uh, it should be event set or performance group. So uh, event set is like the raw events published by the vendors. Um, so you can say measure instruction retired on this counter and so on. Um, or since users are uh, don't want to work themselves into these huge list of events. Um, we provide a set of so-called performance groups, and that's basically an event set plus some derived metrics. So an event would be like the cache line transferred on reloads from L1 to L2. What you are commonly interested in, so users are currently interest, commonly interested in is like data volume and bandwidth. So this is, these are the, these derived metrics. So we specify the raw events and the formulas to derive the metrics out of that for a commonly known metrics. So let's look how this um, 
when we execute it here, we run a liquid perf counter on the first two cores of the memory domain zero. Um, and we measure the, the group, the performance group flops DP. So double precision flops. And then our executable, we again get this output, which what the system is where we run on um, with some CPU clock. So if, if we change the clock of our CPU, um, it would be visible here. Um, and then it's followed by the application output. Um, I left it out here. Um, and then you get tables. Um, so here you get group one, so um, flops DP, the same name. So you can um, come back to that. And then you get a table of the raw events. Um, and here you see already, these are not intuitive, not at all. Um, of course, you can derive something out of them, of the names, if you, if you are familiar with um, um, uh, CPU hardware. Um, but commonly, that's not what people are interested in. Um, and it's hard to compare them because even if they have the same name, it, they might have a different meaning. Um, so here, um, we, we measure the instruction retired, um, the CPU clock. Um, um, so the CPU clock ticks, but under the influence of the changing CPU frequencies, so if we clock the CPU up, um, this counter will in, uh, incre increment faster. Um, and this, the third one, the unhalted breath, is like the reference cycle clock. And the reference cycle clock on Intel, at least, is always the number that is denoted here in the CPU name. So to the, this counter increments with 2.2 gigahertz um, on this system. And then we have three raw events for the floating point instructions, uh, one for 128 byte vectors, um, so that's SSE. Then we have scalars, that's like normal single value um, operations, and 256 byte for ABX. But as I said, these are not intuitive, and uh, they are, can be more than that or less than that, or you have to use a different set. Um, so that's, that's hard to figure out. Um, and then, um, that's why we have these um, derived metrics and they are printed afterwards in a separate table. Um, and there you see like the runtime, uh, the runtime unhalted, which is uh, a, a different runtime and counts only when the CPU is active in user space. So if we switch to kernel space for do IO or something like that, it is reduced. This, this time is not counting, it's not incremented. We see the actual CPU clock. So here we see that it's, it's not using the 2.2 gigahertz uh, reference clock, but using like three gigahertz. Um, so um, it's, it's important to know. So if you wanna calculate something cycle accurate, the, you, you need to know the, the current clock frequency. Um, CPI is a common metric um, for performance engineering purposes, cycles for instructions. Um, so, um, it's like telling you whether all the instructions are quite expensive you execute or have to wait for data or something like that, or whether they can be executed fast and, and everything is available. Then we have the really double flops precision um, floating point number. So we see 790 flops on the core zero and 287 on the core one. Um, no ABX flops. So we see that also in the, in the last table, there were no 256-byte wide uh, FP operations. So also the PACT, no SSE, it's only scalar. Um, and also the vectorization ratio is of course zero for that. So nothing is vectorized um, in this, this executable. Um, the, the main benefit of, of using these metrics is that as soon as you have this derived metric, you can compare it to a different system. So like data volume divided by the iterations of the, of the application to get like the data volume per iteration, um, you can compare that between nodes um, and normally you should get like similar results. Um, and, and, but they show you the difference in, in execution. So that's nice. So we, we, when we start liquid like that, um, it's doing a start to end measurement. So we start the, the, the counters before we run this a dot out executable, stop them afterwards and evaluate them. Um, 
but normally these applications have like the init phase, we allocate memory, we initialize it. Um, then we run our whatever loops, um, the main computation loops. In the end, we write something to files, we evaluate it um, and so on. And that's not what we are interested in. So we are mainly interested in this um, main code region, this main loop nest, this function call, whatever. Um, and for that, we provide the marker API. So for code instrumentation, you can add that to your code. So basically what we have, we have a main header. Um, we have to initialize the library somewhere in the serial region. So somewhere in the main routine, for example, um, at the beginning. Then um, uh, similar to that, we have a liquid marker close. So in the end of the main routine, um, so in a serial region, no parallel execution anymore. Um, and this one like writes out the files um, that are picked up later by liquid again. Um, and then we have some stuff which should run in parallel if you want to have parallel numbers. That's liquid marker register. Um, and then the start and the stop calls around these code regions. The register is, is optional, but recommended. Um, it reduces the overhead of the, um, of the start part um, by already allocating some stuff um, some, uh, and providing like enough space to to store the values we gathered here when we do start stop measurements. Um, as soon as we have uh, added this to our code, um, we have to compile it. We have to link, uh, we have to show where the headers are. So the liquid include here. Um, at the FAU, we provide these modules in the, uh, these variables in the modules. But for you, if it's, it's of course, the include path where liquid is installed. Um, then we have the link path, so where the library is, the liquid library, um, same, you have to check it out on your system. And we need the define for liquid perfmon. Um, we need that one because um, this one enables these calls. So if we don't set this, these calls are all empty and don't cause any overhead. Um, only if we set liquid uh, 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 minus D liquid perfmon, um, there are actual functions behind these um, macros. Um, so you can turn it off and on during compilation, um, whether you want to have profiling or not in your application. So then you link it with uh, minus L liquid, um, and then you can execute it with liquid perf counter again. The marker API is available for Fortran 90, um, Java. Um, Python, Lua, and Julia. Julia is quite new, so released some, some weeks ago um, in collaboration with the Julia labs at MIT. So um, I, don't, I don't figure out how, how that works. Um, that's done by the Julia labs. Um, and then we can run it like before. It's basically the same command. The only thing we add is a minus M for markers. Yeah, so. Um, this tells liquid perf counter that it shouldn't measure itself, but the application measures itself and we just, just print the results in the end. So here we also see that uh, the string we have specified. So in the last slide, we have used bench for the start and the stop and the register. Um, this is also printed here. Um, so if you have multiple regions in your code, you can have multiple regions, you can nest them. Um, then uh, you can have you can check which which result they are based on the string here. Um, it's telling how much runtime is caused by every thread, how how many times the region is traversed um, or called, whatever. Um, and then we see the the same result tables as before. So here are the raw events, and see so you see also that both threads are exactly doing the same amount of scalar um, double precision floating point operations. So this is uh, like nice. So both threads do the exact same amount of work. Um, also here, the instructions and clock cycles and so on are um, like comparable to each other. Um, and we also see that in the flops table then, 
um, both threads have the same amount of flops executed. Um, like before, uh, no change at all. Um, and you do the uh, instrumentation to the application once, um, but control what should be measured from the outside. So um, there are groups for the floating point operations for the um, cache traffic, so L2, L3. Um, there is memory traffic. Um, so that's mem, simple, um, but also like more complicated ones like branch prediction and um, load store ratios and, and so on. So um, can check that out. Um, so liquid, liquid perf counter minus A gives you a list of all the groups which are specified on this hardware. Uh, so which are available on this hardware. Um, this varies a little bit. We try to provide the same amount of groups um, or the same basic set of groups for all architectures. Sometimes it's not possible. Um, for example, the Intel Haswell architecture had no count uh, events to measure flops. Um, so there are, of course, no flops DP group and no flops SP group um, because the hardware doesn't provide any measurement um, possibility. So yeah, that's nice, um, but where to start? So if you have a bigger application, um, it's like the first thing is you, yeah, what should I do now? I, what should I measure? What should I look at? So um, here are some, here's a guideline. So first thing, run your application with the uh, like basic set of groups. So L2, L3, um, MEM data and the flops DP, flops SP, depends on the data type you use in your application. Um, if, if you don't know the runtime contribution of code regions or functions, like if you haven't written the code yourself, it's like you, you took it over from somebody else. Like we do, of course, we do uh, user support at the, at the computing center for HPC users. Um, and if they send us some code, we have no clue about that. Um, so what we do, we do a um, runtime profile using gprof or perf. Um, and then we get like the, the top 10 functions um, which we should uh, instrument and, and check more deeply. Um, here are some guidelines. So if you have short reach and runtime, short reach and time time, I would say like below half a second. Uh, I've not noted it here down because it's like varying a little bit. Um, then instrument at a coarser level. So try to go up and, and use like measure the whole function or whatever. Um, the, these markers of course cause overhead. Um, and if you have a short region with a high call count, um, then the overhead gets, uh, gets increasingly large and you probably don't see anything of your application anymore. So that's why use a coarser level like group it or run the, the loop for multiple times, um, but just take the results of the last one for the, for the application run, stuff like that. Um, if you wanna have like detailed numbers, you have to work a little bit for that. If you have a long reach and runtime larger than 30 seconds, uh, I would recommend to use an instrumentation at a filer level. Um, there are different backgrounds behind these 30 seconds. But basically there are some counters that overflow around every 30, every 40 seconds. Um, and to catch that overflow, it is fundamental to read often enough. Um, so that's why go below 30 seconds for signal um, region calls. Then run, run the application again with the same groups. Um, nothing to change here, just the, the minus M on the command line. Um, and then compare the metrics. So um, is my metric really causing like the overall, uh, the, the, the most of the L2 traffic is like caused by this code region or is it like somewhere else? Um, and this code region is, is basically doing no memory traffic or no cache traffic at all. Um, might be, yeah, it might be pretty inefficient code which runs a long time but just uh, but doesn't con consume a lot of data. Um, and also like how many floating point instructions are compared um, to the region, to the base run, to the first impression um, to see like, um, is it like the 
FP heavy parts that we are currently looking at, or is it something else? Um, yeah. Uh, in order to show you how to work with liquid, um, I show a little performance analysis of a J Jacobi 2D five point stencil in double precision. Um, that's also in preparation for the talk, for the third talk um, with Pi stencils, where we also work on a Jacobi stencil. So that's the basic code. We have um, two arrays and we basically write from one array to the other array by using the surrounding um, points, sum them up and then uh, multiply them by some constant and we run over the whole um, arrays. Uh, so the whole matrices or domains and then we swap the pointers. So um, afterwards we, we swap the X and the Y and then we can simply continue um, until we reach some specific errors, errors or some, um, some step counts. So that's basically how it looks. So we take the, the four surrounding values, sum them up, multiplying this by some constant and write them um, to the result array. This is called a, um, so this is the, the basic thing we look at. This is the main calculation. Um, we use for this one um, an appropriate metric called letter side updates per second. Um, so here we do four floating point operations. So if you want to have the flops value, um, you have to multiply it by four. Um, it is better to use a metric like letter side updates here, because if you rewrite the code differently, it might be that you have like more flops um, despite you doing, doing the same work. So if you write const times x and plus const times this x and constant, then you're doing more flops, but you're doing, basically doing the same amount of work. And with this metric, it is independent of the actual flops executed for calculation. So uh, use a appropriate metric for your code. So if we, if we look at the thing, uh, the na naive balance, um, code balance or uh, data balance um, is we need three loads from X um, because the one value was already loaded in the iteration or two iterations before. Um, and we have one load and one store to Y. Um, so one, uh, so this means we have a, um, uh, we have we use five words per letter side update, which is transferable to 40 bytes per letter side update. So 40 bytes because um, each double position word is um, eight bytes. So eight times five, we have 40 bytes per letter side update. Um, just a reminder, you need the load and the store on the Y here um, because we have to do and write allocate. Um, so in cache core and um, caching hierarchies, um, it is required that the, the cache line um, is transferred to the L1 cache first. So we load it first to L1 cache, then we write to it and then we store it back. Um, that's needed for uh, maintaining the cache coherence um, and to simplify the handling and so on. Um, there are me methods to bypass that and, and other architectures do it differently, but basically that's on, on all x86 architectures. You need to load the Y first if you, before you can store to it. Yeah, you have here load. Um, this one is basically available on the cache before. So this is this one. And, and so if you look at the slide before, um, if we move like in this direction, this value will be this one at some uh, two iterations later. So this one is already in, in cache um, when we are at this iteration. Yeah. Um, yeah, these are all the loads and so on. So um, if we look at it, um, we, we see and, and measure it. Um, we see that we have 24 bytes on the political side update for some range. Um, and then we come, come down to this 40 bytes um, for letter side updates. Um, why it is like that? Can we maintain, so sustain these 600 megaflops, uh, megaloops 
for larger for larger sizes. So like get the performance here. Um, and why 24 bytes at all? I mean, we have calculated that it was 40 bytes per little set update. Um, what is going on here? So these are the, the, the questions that arise if you see this picture. Um, the L3 cache is going to here. Um, so it's quite long. Um, so how, so even uh, after the L3 cache, we still can maintain a high performance before dropping down to these 400 mega loops. Um, okay, this one is, this one is strange. Okay. okay. We, we do it like that. So basically if we, if we run through these, these um, domains, so here we see the end of the last line um, and start up with the new line. Um, we see that basically we need three layers. Um, so these two. Um, so if we can hold these two in cache, um, as soon uh, as long as we calculate here, uh, we can save some loads. Um, this is, of course, we assume that the least recently used replacement strategy is used in the caches, which is like the thing today. So this is the uh, this is the strategy used by all Intel and AMD processors. They have a slightly adapted version, but basically it's the, the least recently used um, algorithm. And of course, everything that is the longest in the, in the cache, so this would be these, these, these three values, they are thrown out of cache at first. So, and then this one, and then this one, so. Um, and as, as long as we can keep that into ca in cache, um, you can have some benefit out of that. That's basically what we see here. So if we reduce the, the inner loop size, the, the J dimension, um, we can come to this um, point where we have complete overlap and, and can reuse all the values we have loaded before in the, in the line before. Um, and then we need to load only this single value. In, um, and this results um, in, in this layer condition. So we need three lines um, for the number, for the, the length of, the, of one row um, times the eight bytes um, to get the data volume. Um, and we use only a half of the cache um, to enable that this really, really works out. Um, so that's a safety margin. We use always, always half of the cache only for calculations, so here for double position, three rows, um, and the layer condition says to us that there's, uh, so we, we don't include the wide traffic here um, because it doesn't matter for, for the loading, for the load part, um, part so for the right-hand side here. Um, and it is only suitable for this stencil. Um, as soon as we have a different stencil, like if we use a longer radius or longer arms here on that side or on that side, we have to increase the number of rows we need and so on. So the layer condition fits for this stencil. Um, and then we can see if, if the layer condition is not fulfilled, we end up with these 40 bytes per loop that we have calculated. So we need these three loads. This one is in cache um, and we have the one in the load, uh, the load in the store for Y. Um, if we fulfill the layer condition, um, we just have to load this single value um, and combined with this load and store from the Y, we end up with this 24 bytes uh, per loop. Yeah. And if we do that, so if we apply proper blocking in our code, um, we can see here the green line is blocking in L2. So we fulfill the layer condition in L2. And then we can keep up with these uh, above 600 mega loops um, value. Um, if we use the, uh, the layer condition in L3, so we use a bigger block size um, so that it fits in L3, we can stay on this level here. Um, so we don't drop down to the main memory performance, um, but can keep up the L3 performance. So the performance coming out basically because we store data in the L3 cache. Um, we can also see that um, if we measure the, the um, data volume per letter set update, 
So at this point, um, we, we need this 24 bytes um, per little set update here, 24 bytes. Um, but at some point, um, so if the naive version, we go up to 40 bytes per iteration here. So that's the blue line here. Um, with, the, with the green line fulfilled, so layer condition in L2 um, doesn't increase at all um, because all, all our data is already uh, is present in L2. We just need to reload a little bit. Um, in L3, it's like a little bit varying, um, but basically we also can, can stay slight, uh, slightly above this 24 bytes per loop. So to sum that up, um, Liquid is a, is a tool suite for day-to-day -to -day tools for HPC users. So um, pinning at least is very handy um, for users. And, and if you figured out like how to use Liquid, um, Liquid pin, a uh, Liquid MPI run, um, it's pretty handy also to use it for your MPI applications because you don't need to care about the actual hardware under the hood. You can use these affinity domains um, and, it, and it works out on whatever node you are. Um, the system information gives you, gives you really benefit if you, also for, for publishing and, and, and pinning it. Uh, so if you publish it in a paper, um, Liquid Topology basically contains all information you need for the, the test system section. Um, we provide uh, hardware performance event measurements for all relevant HPC relevant systems. So I showed only x86, but Liquid also runs on ARM8 and Power and NVIDIA GPUs. So there's quite some, um, you can use it on quite a lot of systems. Um, as I said, the, the current fastest supercomputer in the world, Fugaku, um, Liquid runs on it and works fine. Um, we have powerful instrumentation um, for the regions of interest. So you can just mark them, um, you can nest them, have multiple of them. Um, also for the GPU, um, you can do GPU instrumentation. Um, we are planning other accelerators. At the moment, it's only NVIDIA GPU and uh, also the, the latest uh, type of NVIDIA GPUs. NVIDIA has changed the um, APIs uh, at some generation. And as far as I know, there are not many tools out there at the moment which can handle the more recent NVIDIA GPU um, profiling. Um, just as a, as a final uh, remark, uh, think about your code, not just profile it. So Liquid just prints your numbers. Um, the meaning of the numbers is not printed by Liquid, so you have to think about. Um, it's always beneficial to have a model like we did with the Jacobi with these 40 bytes per loop. Um, and then we saw that the model doesn't fit. So we learned something and uh, we could uh, use this knowledge to later optimize it and do blocking. Um, so if the model fits, you, you can gain insight. Um, where and what to optimize. So if we had these 40 bytes per loop um, all the time, we could check out and, and see, okay, this fits. Um, what can we change on the model and maybe on the, on the application to get it run faster? And then we can just uh, manipulate the model and see already, okay, this helps or this doesn't help. Here I get also 40 bytes per loop, although I changed like the code three days. Um, so it gives you, an, gives you valuable insights um, where and what to optimize and, and when to stop. Yeah, that's all for now. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask um, either in the chat or uh, turn, turn on your mic. I'm happy to answer any questions. I guess we, we had a question about MPI, but uh, another question about MPI from Robert, but I'm not sure uh, it was answered. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the MPI process are pinned the same way as the application as uh, so open P threads or whatever. So I think I answered it during the talk. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's a, there's a tool for that liquid MPI run. Um, uh, you can use it for pinning. <clears throat> there are a couple of questions in the frame pad. Oh, I haven't opened that. I'm not... Can somebody read that for me or read it loud? That would be great. 
Um, ah, if somebody posted it, I can check it. So there are a couple of questions as well in the from a bad document, so I can read them. Uh, so there is a question about MPI, and then there is a question: Is liquid pin comparable to HW log bind, or um, is it working for a different set of problems? So yeah, liquid is using HW log under the hood. Um, so since the beginning of HW log, we we try to to integrate that. Um, we don't use HW log bind, so the the same calls under the hood, um, because um, it's it's too late um, when you when you can apply that. Um, what we do, we override the the pre thread create system call, so directly the um, and as soon as the thread is started, we directly pin it. So there's no way for the thread to do something else than accept this pinning. Yeah. Okay. So I'm I'm in the in the framework I saw I saw I see here is uh, how does liquid pin work in combination with job schedulers MPI launchers? Um, it's working quite well. Um, that's why we have these um, availability uh, flag in the in the topology. Which is also respected by liquid pin so um, normally job schedulers reduce the set of cpus for you um, and this is respected by liquid pin um, if you want to select a core which is not available in your cpu set um, it will tell you that um, and use something uh, and, and use like a, a logical pinning inside the available cpu set um, but yes it's it's working out um, no liquid is liquid perf counter is reading the counters itself. There's no puppy under the hood. Um, we have different access modes. Uh, there is the direct access mode where you need to be root, which has less uh, the minimal overhead of all backends. Then we have a perf counter mode, uh, uh, a perf event mode, which is using the, the kernel level perf um, interface, the same thing that puppy uses under the hood. Um, but despite, uh, although Papi uses uh, offers all events at some point, um, Liquid always provides all events that are available for a given hardware. So it's not just a, a set of events that we provide, but we provide all of them. Um, so even like very obscure ones that you will never use, um, they are supported. Um, yeah. Um, and the, th the third mode is the access daemon mode, which is like an intercept um, mode and enables you to, uh, to, as a user, to access these hardware registers, which is commonly only allowed to be as root. So um, it's like a privilege escalation daemon, I would say, um, but it's safe. Uh, it's used by many operating, by many um, computing centers, it's checked by the Debian security team. So that I think that's the best honor you can get. Um, if they say, yeah, it's okay, then it's okay. Um, and what if a region is called several times? Yes, the values are accumulated. So you get the values for, um, um, for, the, for all traversals of the region, the call count increases. Um, so as you, uh, shown in the slides, there's a call count table and this one increases per each each time it is uh, traversed okay um and i got a direct question which i probably answer now during the talk of sebastian yeah if there are any questions i'm, I'm still here the the afternoon um and you can uh post questions in the chat um directly or whatever. Um, yeah. Thanks for the audience. Bye. Thank you. So we can switch on to the next talk. All right, do you see my slides? Yep. Yes. Okay, very good. 
Um, yeah, so I'll just start. Um, I was asked to give a little introduction um, to code generation techniques in the scope of this workshop, which I will, of course, gladly do. Um, my name is Sebastian, and yeah, let's just dive right in. Um, I'll start with a little bit of a motivation. And this sort of um, is in connection with the last talk, because one of the governing motivations for us is that we want to achieve good performance. And we're using very expensive hardware, which uses a lot of energy. So what we want to do is make the best of that and use that hardware to its full extent. Um, as we've heard in the previous talk, we can assess how well we're doing with profiling and performance modeling. And hopefully, um, we get a good performance in the end. Um, but this is not all we're after, if we're honest. So another metric that is quite important for us as software developers is productivity. And by productivity, I mean stuff like program productivity. And you could go ahead and measure that in some arbitrary metric like lines of code per hour. But this doesn't really give you a good um, estimate because more, some languages might be more expressive. Using some um, existing software components might make a job easier or less easy. And so what you really want to do is have a look at minimizing the effort to implement a certain whatever and whatever could be like an algorithm or a feature um, or a given optimization such as the um, spatial blocking we've heard about in the previous talk or a certain parallelization approach. Um, and especially with the parallelization approach and the optimization approach, you quickly run into another um, motivating factor that you need to take into account and that is portability. And portability um, in this case means on the one hand that you want to execute your code ideally on different hardware. And this could mean switching just simply from an Intel CPU to a different Intel CPU or to an AMD CPU, but also something like switching from a CPU to a GPU or from a CPU implementation to a CPU and GPU hybrid implementation. And while portability is sort of the bare minimum that you want to achieve, you often also want to have something that is called performance portability. And we've heard about that in the scope of this workshop as well. And this is something that is not as easy to achieve. And the main issue you're facing when you want to um, pursue these three P's of so performance, productivity, and portability is the increasing diversity in hardware and software. And on the hardware side, we've seen that on, and we have different CPU vendors, so AMD and Intel and IBM, Fujitsu um, in Japan. And um, on the GPU side, predominantly NVIDIA, but also um, new, newer GPUs coming up from AMD and Intel, is, um, particularly in the new US systems. And then on the horizon, there's also other technologies such as FPGAs. And the issue, if you want to compute on them or do computations with them, you need to specialize the software. And if you want to have really good performance, you usually want to um, implement stuff close to the metal. So for the CPU side, you might um, really go into implementing vector intrinsics to um, force the vectorization for that specific CPU you're working on. Um, and then you want to parallelize that maybe inside of a node using, let's say, OpenMP. And for the CPU side, this is already um, quite a lot of work and it needs usually to be tuned to the machine um, you're working on. But then additionally, um, you want to use a GPU maybe. So you have to use, um, or you could use something like, <clears throat> excuse me, a vendor specific approach such as CUDA or Rockham from NVIDIA and AMD respectively, or use something higher level, um, which tries to abstract across multiple vendor specific implementations, um, something like OpenMP 4 plus 4 or 5, or OpenACC SQL, or um, Data Parallel C++, which is a part of Intel's one API. And all of that is just within one node. So you're not really exploiting um, any parallelism beyond that yet. So you probably want to couple that with something additional. Um, and what I think is predominant right now running on our clusters is MPI plus X where MPI, of course, could be expressed by some other, tech, um, other software component, which encapsulates that away. OK, so this is quite a challenge. Um, what are approaches that we could do, or what can we do as software developers to um, address that? So on the one hand, um, we can do standalone applications. And this has been done for basically since the beginning of software development. 
Um, you write one application for only a single purpose running on a single hardware. And ideally, this is also implemented and maintained by one or at least only a couple of persons. And if you can um, guarantee that scope and you don't want to um, do more than that, then this is a perfectly valid thing to do. And also for prototype implementations, this is very attractive. And just to compare um, the pros and cons, um, on the one hand, this can be highly optimized um, because you can really specify um, the, or specialize that for the hardware at hand. But on the other side, of course, um, this sort of prohibits performance portability. As a developer, you have to full control over source code, but as soon as you leave your scope, um, your productivity will suffer a lot. Okay, so what um, can we do otherwise? Well, we can raise the level of abstraction, and this is also nothing new. This has been done for decades now, and sort of go from um, explaining or implementing what, um, how something is computed to um, describing what we want to compute, and then have a tool figure out the best way to do that. And when I talk about abstraction in the scope of this talk, um, what I mean is on the one hand data. So how do we represent data? And this includes data structure and handling. And then as a next step, um, how computations are performed on set data. And once we have those computations, we can think about parallelization. And this is usually what you um, look at if you look at code generation or stuff like that. But of course, you could also go to an even higher abstraction and say, OK, I want to have that um, in a mathematical sense, or I want to define what I want to compute as mathematical operations, or even I just want to specify the physics that I want to solve for um, coming more from an application scientist view. OK, and in this talk, I try to sort of give an impression of um, the technologies that I'm presenting from the view of what I call an application scientist. So this is the guy who actually wants to do applied scientist as science. So this could be a physicist or a chemist or an applied mathematician. Um, and usually um, he or she is not really interested in optimization, parallelization and stuff like that. He just wants, he or she just wants to have an answer to the problem he or she is asking. And on the other hand, there's the view of the computer scientist or software developer. And um, this is the person who helps others or enables others um, to do applied science. And he, of course, here, um, providing suitable abstractions, um, optimizing code, uh, parallelizing in, in a suitable way, and so on and so forth is quite important. Um, throughout this talk, I will have a running example. And this, um, again, um, connects to what Thomas has been um, talking about. So what we're doing is we're, we'll have a look at the Laplace equation and discretize that with the simplest um, approach that is conceivable, and which is finite differences. And we do this on a uniform grid in 2D to get something like this representation. And if you look at the index combinations, you again see this five-point star we've also seen in the talk before. And um, if you want to solve that, you could use something like Jacobi iterations. Of course, in practice, nobody would ever do that or should ever do that. But just for the sake of this presentation, let's assume this is what we actually want to do. Then you get the update rule you've also seen in a previous talk already. And if you have that update rule, you can then implement this in, let's say, C++. And it, um, what you have is a twice um, nested loop over, an, um, over the grid. And if you look closely, you can see this goes from 1 to nx minus 1. So there's a halo region around, such that we don't have any access violations here. And in the end, what we do is also what we've seen before, we sum up the neighbors, um, multiply this by a constant, and assign this to some other field. OK. Now imagine you have that implementation. The next step maybe um, would be thinking about how uh, to parallelize that. And one option for a CPU would just be adding an OpenMP clause. So this is rather straightforward. Just have a Pragma open, um, OpenMP parallel 4. And in this case, we also add a collapse to to uh, capture both of these loops. But this is optional. And if you think about GPU, you may just want to offload that um, rather straightforwardly um, using OpenACC. And again, you get something quite similar. You just have a Pragma ACC parallel loop. 
again with a collapse too to really ensure that you have the um, a, a appropriate or necessary um, level of parallelism and then you can map that to a GPU. Of course, in a real application, if you really would use OpenACC, you usually would specify more parameters here. So you would go into detail about the data movement and so on and so forth. This is skipped here for the sake of brevity. Okay. So what are typical approaches? Um, on the one hand, traditionally, by, if you want to raise the level of abstraction, you implement um, an HPC framework or library. And examples for that can be seen in the XSDK from the US, um, which is a more or less recent development. And they try to summarize different packages, such as Tridunos, Patsy, Hyper, DL2, and many more. And what's special about them is they want uh, or they require every package to fulfill a set of guidelines. So the code needs um, to be documented, needs to be tested, there needs to be a mailing list or at least some way to um, reach the developers and so on and so on and so on. And this is rather nice. Um, and as sort of second example, I also want to talk a little bit about Valvola. This is um, a framework which is developed at MyShare and this is written in C++. And, and probably um, some of you are already familiar with that um, throughout um, this um, EU project. And what they are doing, or what they originally did, was implementing lattice Boltzmann methods um, on a massively parallel scale. Um, but over the last years, um, this has been, or this has grown to a fully fledged multi physics framework, um, which still has as a, one of the cornerstones LBM, but also, um, for instance, allows computations of particles and particles in fluid. And the typical challenges we face with this framework and also some of the other frameworks are facing is the introduction of new programming models. Because and this requires to change a lot of the code. And if it also touches the data structures, this is very difficult to do. And this gets sort of worse because if you want to port this to novel hardware, you usually have to introduce new programming models. So um, this is the challenge we're facing. Um, but nevertheless, since this is state of the art, I just want to evaluate this very quickly as well. So for an HPC framework for users, there's an increase in productivity because they can rely on stuff that's already implemented. But of course, there's also an initial cost to learn about a framework. And in the end, they have limited control over performance portability because whatever the framework implements as performance portability is what the user gets. So this is hard to change. On the developer side, framework is more or less just like a very big specialized code. So this can be highly optimized, but with the same kind of cost. So performance portability, portability is challenging. So of course you have the option to just specialize for different hardwares and provide a lot of different implementations, but usually the maintainability then is a little bit, well, hard. And again, you have full control over software. So you don't have any additional tools um, if it's slow, you can work out what is going wrong and you can fix it. But as I said before, so the performance portability is challenging and by that also the productivity for the developers is challenging. Um, so one trend that, have, that we've been observing in the recent years is introducing a new abstraction layer inside such frameworks. And one example for that is Cocos from the US, which has been developed since 2012. It's targeting C++ code again and equips um, these frameworks which use Cocos to um, implement kernels or to allow implementation of kernels that can run on CPU and GPU. Th their main focus is parallelism within one node. So usually the framework around um, whatever is implemented in Cocos is providing the MPI layer and, and taking care of the internode communication. But again, within one node, you can then use Cocos for the parallelization across CPUs and GPUs. They um, state that they um, have over 100 projects which use Cocos at the moment. And on these projects, about 500 developers are actively developing. OK, so how does this look in code? So um, if you remember the OpenMP example before, this is not that diff different. So, the thing that changed is that the first for loop is just replaced by a Cocos parallel four. 
Um, then we provide an iteration space. So this is again from uh, one to um, ny minus one. And then as a body to that parallel four, we have a Cocos Lambda, which um, receives one parameter. And then the rest of the code is just the same. So this is again, then the I loop and the assignment. And if you look at that, if you could would map that to OpenMP, for instance, you would get a code very similar to what we've had before. But if you map that to a GPU, you will find that the degree of parallelism is probably not sufficient because you're only um, parallelizing over one dimension when you should be uh, parallelizing over two dimensions. Um, but of course, Cocos um, provides something for that as well. Um, by just having um, a multi-dimensional parallel for, in this case, with a range policy of rank two, going from one, one to an X minus one and Y minus one, and then providing a Lambda that gets not one parameter, but two parameters. So the iterators we've had before, and then internally the compute kernel is the same. Um, one thing that you need to keep in mind sort of is that these kernels need to be um, side effect free. So they need to be perfectly parallelizable in other words which can be quite a restriction depending on the application you want to implement. And of course, as you can see, you have two ways here um, to implement the same kernel and both will, will work, but will exhibit completely different performance characteristics. So to summarize that for users, um, they, they are sort of forced to implement their kernels inside the framework now in a very restrictive layer. Um, which on the plus side is still valid C++. So it's not that different from what they're used to, but of course, in some cases, they need to change the algorithms they're using or the way they implement them. And as we've seen before, some of the implementation details need to be designed or chosen with the target hardware in mind. So yes, you have sort of um, a portability layer, but you still need to keep in mind the execution platform you're targeting and maybe tune to that. So it doesn't fully solve the problem. Um, for the developers of the framework, well, on the plus side, they only have one implementation for multiple backends. So this is very good for productivity, of course. Um, but on the negative side, it's more complicated to integrate that into your workflow. Um, and depending on what kind of build system you're using and um, how this is set up, this can work very well or it can be very complicated, but it is something that has to be kept in mind in any case. Okay, so what are possible alternatives? Well, since the title of the talk was um, code generation introduction, well, of course, we can have a look at code generation. And in the simplest case or the most traditional case, one could just use C++ templates because these are already a type of code generation. And in this case, you're using the C++ compiler to um, do the code generation for you. But of course, um, it still is code generation. So we could say we have again our Jacobi, and now we want to template the data type of our fields. And just the same, we want to template um, the dimensions of the grid we're looking at. And if we instantiate that for one particular use case, we could say, okay, we want to just have a single precision floating point computation. And we want to do this on um, 256 inner points. So 258 with the halo. And as you can see, um, the compiler would already be able to um, optimize this calculation here because these are all constants. And um, inside the index calculation um, for 2D, there's not that much potential, but in 3D, um, you could of course think about calculating the stride in the Z dimension. So this would be NX times NY, which then could also be inline. So just by specializing that here, um, we already gain performance potentially anyway. Um, and of course, um, have a specialized implementation, which we devised from a generic one, um, which is why templates is, are popular, of course. Um, we can do then, of course, um, other implementations using, for instance, double, um, but also plugging in something that the original developer may not have intended to. So something like a standard complex, for instance. And for this kernel, using just complex numbers would work, of course, but it is sort of challenging to ensure that as a developer of such code generation um, frameworks or such template implementations. 
Okay, so to evaluate that for users, it's it's the good thing is it's still a built-in language feature. So they don't have to leave their familiar programming language of C++. But on the negative side, um, especially if this is used in excess, it can increase, uh, increase compile times by quite a lot in the worst case. And it can increase code complexity as well. So if you have seen um, some um, frameworks or codes where this has really been done in excess, um, the template um, specifications alone can be multiple tens of lines of code. And this, of course, makes it very hard to read. And the reason for that is that you need to propagate the information for the templates throughout your hierarchy of function calls or class instantiations or whatever. Um, for developers, it's basically the same picture. Um, but on top of that, they also need to ensure that all the possible variants are sort of working correctly, or at least that this, um, the code can catch these cases where it doesn't work. Um, and depending on the scope of the framework, of course, this can be very challenging. Okay, one alternative to that is saying, okay, I'm not using this rather restrictive um, core set of the C++ compiler and the template um, technology, but I'm using an external tool that I use to generate that code. And just as a reminder, this is um, our well, use case or has been our use case, we want to have the same code running on CPUs and GPUs parallelized with OpenMP and OpenACC. So of course, the most straightforward approach if you want to generate this is just say, okay, this looks rather similarly, I just do some string manipulation. And in practice, there, there are really projects using that. And if you don't do something too complicated, it works. And in our case, one could simply say, okay, I have a, a Python function that gets two flags. Um, do we want to use OpenMP? Do we want to use OpenACC? And gets two values for NX and NY, so specializing the grid size again. And then we have a simple function, which composes our pragma that we want to use. And depending on the flags, this is then just sort of um, the, the, the pragma we've seen before. And using this function, we then can compose the kernel. And here we use f strings. We call the, the pragma function, which evaluates whatever we want to do. And then we have the loops. And we can already inline stuff like ny and nx. And also do that here in the calculation. And you can see this is really straightforward. Um, it's really easy to understand. And for users, um, they favor the low complexity. Um, this is a very low bar to get into that tool. And um, whatever you implement is still reasonably close to the final generated code. <clears throat> so it's not that you're doing something which is completely different to what you end up with. Um, nevertheless, it is an extra step in a development workflow. And in many cases, you have to change the language. And depending on um, where this is implemented, this can be good or bad. So if you're implementing this in Python, maybe users even value that they have, <coughs> excuse me, um, even value that they have more options because they have the full power of the Python programming language to compose those strings. Um, but this is, of course, not um, necessarily the case in any in, in any case. And the key issue that um, have, we've been seeing in practice is that debuggability is really um, not there if you're using the string-based approach. Um, if everything goes right, it's perfectly well. If it goes wrong, it's hard to restress what went wrong. And on the developer side, well, these sort of tools are easy to conceptualize and implement because um, you are already more or less aware what the output should be, and there's not too much variance, so that's um, not difficult to implement. However, um, there's a limited range of features um, with, for, for the code generation itself. Um, and in particular, what is challenging is doing code transformations. So you compose the string, and once you have the string, you sort of, you sort of have to live with it. So changing this in a second step or even an iterative fashion is rather difficult, um, if possible at all. And tying into the debuggability problem, getting any sort of validation of the generated code, so just checking if this um, fulfills some basic premises is usually not possible. Um, 
lest you want to analyze that code in depth, um, which of course um, is usually not um, a suitable way to do that. And the main issue, if you're looking at the debuggability and validation and so on, is that the code generator has no idea what it actually generates. So for the code generator, this is just some string uh, manipulation. So um, going on from that issue, one solution could of course be just composing something abstract that allows analysis and manipulation, which then can be mapped to um, some sort of string or source code. And this is usually called an intermediate representation or IR for short, or an abstract syntax, uh, syntax tree called AST for short. Um, and we will see um, more about that in the next presentation. Um, when you have such a um, representation or an initiation of that representation, um, you need a pretty printer to map that to that source code. And um, the main feature of that approach is that we now have the ability to do code transformations and that we can um, also um, sort of take these co single code transformations and build a code transformation pipeline. So we can have one um, representation, do some manipulation on that, produce a different representation. Okay, let's also have a look here how this could look like in practice. So let's say again, we're using Python and we would just wanna build up our hierarchy. And since this is an AST, um, we have nodes in a tree. So we have as a base class, an abstract base class, in this case, a node. And this node um, and every other node that inherits from it has to provide three functions. One is a simple constructor, so there's not much magic, not much magic there. At the bottom, there's a pretty printer. This is what I've been talking about before. So something that maps whatever we have as a node in our tree to a string representation. And then for the transformations, um, there are different approaches. And in this case, we're using something rather straightforward by just um, uh, requiring every node to implement a function that is able to apply a transformation. And we will see how this looks like in practice um, in two or three slides. So given that sort of interface, let's implement a node for um, some sing simple for loop, since this is one of the cornerstones of the example code we've seen before. And this could look something like this. So as a signature, we require an iterator and a begin and an end, as well as a body. And in the constructor, we do nothing special. We just store all these values um, as class members. And then we can already go to implementing the pretty printer, which is um, also not too difficult. So um, using an external printer class, we can then print the iterator, we can print the begin and the end. And this is just buffered to make this part here more readable. And once we have that, we can then generate the C++ loop. And as you can see, this is still rather close to the code which is sort of what we wanted. Um, of course, you could raise um, the, or you could introduce more abstractions here. So you could say, okay, this uh, I encapsulate in a comparison node, this I encapsulate in a pre-increment node, and so on and so on. But in the end, this will really um, still look more or less like this. And while this looks kind of similar to the approach before where we, do, where we did the string manipulation, this is something completely different because here um, we're really recursively calling the print function of uh, underlying nodes. So for this loop, it's not relevant what happens inside the body um, because it's just a responsibility of the body or the nodes in the body to print themselves. And this makes it much more composable. Um, and then the last step, as I said before, is um, implementing a function that applies a transformation. And um, we just say, okay, we have a transformation class and we will see an example for that later on too, um, which provides an apply method. So everything this class has to do is just call the apply method for every member of itself. So the iterator um, gets just transformed um, to provide a new iterator. 
and the begin gets transformed and so on and so on. So you can see this is an in-place transformation. So this changes the AST or IR. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you would also have the possibility here to just build up a new AST or IR if you um, want to go back and forth between different transformations. But for this example, let's just stick with that. And once we have that, um, we can think about implementing transformations. So if we think about this example we've had before, one minor detail you might have noticed or not is that the loop orders actually interchanged between these two implementations. So here for promoting uh, caching and access patterns, we um, have the J loop as the outer loop. And here for convention or whatever reason, we have the I loop as the outer loop. If this makes sense or not depends on what you're actually trying to do in the end. Um, but for the sake of this talk, let's just say this is what we want to have as a use case. So um, by just adding different programs for the different backends, we're not done. We need to be able to also adapt the loop structures. And since we have this cool transformation system that we've just sort of devised, um, we can implement something in that system. And this looks a little bit or could look like a little bit like this. So we have some transformation class um, with an um, trivial constructor, which then um, overloads an apply function. And what this does is really look for some specific node and replace it with some other specific node. Um, so let's just go through this line by line. Um, so first we check if a node, the node we're applying our transformation at, at the moment, is an instance of a for loop. So everything that's not a for loop, we ignore. Um, for convenience, we also bind this node to this um, outer variable just to make it more verbose. Okay, if we have found a for loop, we want to check um, if we want to uh, if the next statement in the body of that loop is also a for loop, such that we can exchange those two. So what we do is first we check if the length of the outer body is one. So there's only one element. So in other words, this should be a perfectly nested loop. And um, this outer body first element, so the first element in the body, is again um, um, of the type for loop. Um, again, we bind this to inner just to make it more readable um, from here on out. And if we find such a construct, we know that we have a for loop with a for loop in the body, and we can just switch the bodies of the inner and the outer for loop. Um, of course, you would also need to switch some other stuff here. This has um, been left out for brevity. Um, but nevertheless, in the end, you return the new outer loop, which was previously the inner loop. And in case this, uh, you don't have a perfect loop nest, you of course have to specialize your transformation. Then everything gets a little bit more complicated, but it's still doable. And when you look at this, at this level, you can of course also do stuff like um, implement tiling or spatial blocking such as um, we've heard before. And you could analyze the body for access patterns to find out what kind of layer condition you need to apply to specify or to derive your blocking factors and so on and so on. So this is a very powerful tool. And this is um, also um, what the user um, sees. This is a powerful tool, but it's a tool that's rather difficult to use from a user perspective because um, usually users don't want to implement inside of code generators because it's a little too complicated. However, for the developers, um, we have really a good mechanic to uh, implement parallelization approaches, optimizations, other transformations. We have a lot of control, but of course this control comes at a price. We need to pay attention to carefully design these kind of abstractions such that they fit our, um, yeah, whatever we want to do. And of course, um, there's a rather high implementation effort because you need to implement all of these classes um, you need to implement all of the functions of the class and so on and so on. And um, if depending on what your IR is, this could be hundreds of different node types. Um, but of course, once you have that, you can also reason about um, the, the co computations, for instance, that are expressed within that IR. So if 
um, for instance, um, you look at the way variables are used, you could find out that something is not declared or that something um, isn't used and then trigger a warning or an error. So this is a huge step up compared to these string-based approaches. And of course, just to um, be complete, um, this implementation effort could be lowered by using an established tool and building up on LVM, MLIR or something other than that. <clears throat> but again, depending on the abstractions that you need, this might be too concrete um, and not abstract enough or not. That depends. Okay, so coming back to the issue of the user. So um, the user doesn't really want to um, implement in the code generator directly, usually anyway. Um, so this is why in practice, usually there's a custom front end and one of um, the possibilities here is using a dedicated programming language. And um, since this implements some abstractions that are specific to a certain domain, this is usually called the domain specific language or DSL. So nothing new again. And what is important is that this DSL is really crafted specific to one class of problems, which is called the domain. Um, so this could be one set of algorithms on one set, um, specific data structure um, or one type of PDE you want to solve or just, I don't know, particle dynamics, whatever that is. And that then allows you to implement the language in a way that it exposes concepts and also syntax that is familiar to potential users. And this is one of the key qualities of DSLs. And again, this provides a very high level of abstraction if you choose to um, do it like that. And um, in practice, DSLs could be internal or external. So it could either be the, a part of a, tar, uh, of a host language or not. And um, we will have a look at this uh, on the next two slides. So uh, internal DSL would uh, be an extension or restriction of a host language, a GPL usually. And one example you will also see in the next talk and can get your hands on in the next talk is PyStencils, which is sort of the solution um, for our internal framework. A framework as, um, that we've been developing, as said before, also faced the challenge of the three Ps. And what we um, went for is, in, is using a code generation tool in Python um, that generates kernels for that framework. Nevertheless, this tool can also be used standalone. So without the framework as a backend, um, just generating C++, CUDA, or Python code. And if it is Python code, of course, it can also be executed from Python directly. Um, and um, in more recently, we also used this Py, uh, this, uh, Py stencils uh, tool as a backend for another tool, which is called LBM Py, where we raised the level of abstraction even more and there um, we can express different LBM formulations, which can then again be mapped to abstract stencil representations, which can then be mapped to framework code or just um, standalone code. And in this case, we want to have a look at the implementation or one possible implementation as well. So this is again Python, rather straightforward. So you have some Py stencils fields, which are 2D fields. Then you define your stencil as an assignment um, of the destination. And this kernel should, be, should look very familiar by now. And in the end, you create a kernel from the stencil and compile that, meaning map that to code. And this is, I would say, more or less the developer's view. For users, um, it might be more attractive to use um, a, something that is closer to an internal DSL, um, which is which could look like this. So you have this specialist assignment here. So this is your update. And um, with the exception of this little um, changed assignment operator, this looks like Python code. Um, it's wrapped in a function, um, which is decorated. And then um, in this case, we don't want to generate a kernel and compile that but instead we want to generate a sweep. So this would be the lingo for generating um, one computational stage in our target framework with some, for some given context, with some given label. And in the end, we just 
provide that function we've seen above here um, from which an AST is derived, which can then be pretty printed as code for the framework. Okay, so for users, um, this is perceived as a part of a familiar uh, general purpose language, so that's good, but it can be difficult to write code that matches the ex uh, expectations of the DSL. So this is sort of similar to what we've seen with Cocos in the beginning. For developers, it's easier to design something like that, um, but the main challenge is that you usually need to be able to handle arbitrary code from the host language, either within the parts you're looking at or around that, because even if those um, arbitrary parts of the host language are not part of your compute kernels, and those might block certain optimizations. So just imagine you want to do loop fusing and you have some arbitrary statement in between two loops. Of course, you cannot do it or you need to understand the whole um, host language, which is equally challenging. Okay, so on the other end of the spectrum, um, there are external DSLs, as I said before, you have the full freedom. And we have looked at this in the Access Stencils project where we uh, didn't just implement one domain specific language, but multiple ones for different kinds of users. And I will just go over this rather briefly. So on, in one language, we have a continuous formulation. So this is for PDE solvers, um, which is latex-like. So ideally you can just copy paste that from your um, scientific publication. Then you um, describe the discretization, compose a solver and um, summarize that into a complete specification where you can also tweak the parallelization and data structures. And most of this, the flow between those different layers is done automatically for you. So this is nothing you as a user have to do by hand. And then what we've, it follows the path we've seen before. We map this to an intermediate representation, do a lot of transformations and map that to target code, which in this case is C++ with MPI. So this generates the MPI communication as well. Um, and if you choose to open MP and or QDA. Okay. And Going back to our um, Jacobi solver, what we actually, as a domain scientist, want to write down is something like this. So we have a domain, let's say um, uh, 256 by 256. We have some unknown which is defined on that domain. This is what we're looking for. And okay, we have some arbitrary boundary conditions. These were not part of, um, of the example before, but um, for the sake of completeness, that's specified here. And then we have an operator minus Laplace. And with this operator, we can then build up an equation. And ideally, this is all we have to do because this is what we want to solve. We don't really care if there's this finite differences, um, what, how this is solved, how this is optimized, parallelized, whatever. This is just what we want to have. Um, nevertheless, using existences, we can do an automated finite difference discretization. So this looks a little bit like this, so we get a stencil and this is again valid DSL code. So we have an offset coefficient notation. And once we have this, um, we can say we, um, compute, uh, co we compose a compute kernel um, saying we want to loop over U. So this encapsulates this twice folded uh, loop nest that we've seen before. And what we actually want to do is not implement some um, some update rule, but what we want to do is, well, we want to solve locally at each point our PDE, which is Laplace times u equals zero. And this is perfectly fine. So the compiler will then set up this representation that we've seen before, solve that for the unknown and generate an update, which is identical to what we've implemented before. Of course, you could also implement this by hand. And the only thing here uh, that is interesting um, for the sake of time is this add operator, which is encoding an offset access, so accessing a neighbor value, and this co um, colon operator, which accesses um, the coefficient of a stencil or an operator in a certain direction. So this would be just minus one, and again, minus one, and so on. This would internally all be inlined, and just then uh, the, the assignment that comes out of that is again um, identical to what we've seen before. So to wrap this up, um, for the users, they have a very high productivity um, uh, using just familiar concepts, um, but this comes as a price of having to learn a whole new language. And what they usually perceive is very limited control. So this is an issue in practice. For the developer, it's good because you have full control over every aspect and you can choose what happens. But 
um, you need more effort, you need to design the language, you need to um, devise a software stack that handles that language, refines that, uh, set up the IR and so on and so on. Okay, so at this point, the kernels can be pretty printed from the IR and the different variants are, and once again, you could either generate this as a kernel to be used by a trivia code or an underlying framework, or you could um, generate those to use a given runtime. Um, so not too um, different to what we've heard before in different other talks. And you could also say, as in the case of exercises, you'd not just generate a kernel, you generate a kernel and the data structures um, that are used in the kernel. And of course, if you go the latter approach or the latter way, you could also say, I want to um, generate the data communication. So MPI, host device, and so on and so on and so on. And you can generate in the end um, a lot. And it depends if this is worth it, if there's enough variance in what you generate. Usually for the data communication, we see that this needs to be specialized to the computation and the data structures. Um, but for other um, applications, this might not be the case. OK, I will skip over that uh, in the interest of time, go straight to the summary and skip that slide as well, because um, the slides will be published anyway. And um, want to use the last minute to quickly go about, about challenges. So if you want to introduce code generation in your projects, um, the first challenge is to find the right level of, of abstraction. And again, so we're tempted to think about these abstractions and just in terms of parallelism. But in most cases, you can do more. You can go to a high level of abstraction, make it much more accessible, easier to use. And since you can compose these different um, levels in your code generation and pipeline, this is perfectly fine. Then you need to get users and developers on board. And one of the main um, well, critiques we usually hear is, well, as a user, I lose all the control. So I don't know what's going to happen. And here, um, just mapping towards another high level source language like C++ or Fortran really helps because the user can inspect the code. Um, and on the other side, we, of course, as developers for code generation uh, technologies need to provide some sort of debugging support and or tool support in general. Then we need to ensure co code maintainability and longevity. So this is another issue um, prospective users usually face. They say, well, if I now focus or use that technology, what happens in 10 years? Will it still be maintained? Is it just one PhD project? What's going to happen? So you, this is something that needs to be addressed. And of course, ideally, you would already prepare for the next generation of hardware and programming models, or at least have something that's flexible enough to accommodate for that. And what I think is the, or the most interesting challenge in the next years is thinking about how to update or upgrade legacy code that is already existent and or tied in with that. And if I have a code generation approach, how can I couple with existing code? And I want to have that in an abstract way. So I, of course, I can have a backend for every single framework I want to work with, but this is probably not what is practical in the end. Okay, and with that, I'm um, more or less in time. I'd like to thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, let me also look in the pad. There are no questions in the pad. Okay. No questions on the bag, yes. What do you think of source to source, same language and slaves? Okay. Um, so I think it's a good idea, um, especially because it gives users a sense of control and a sense of familiarity because they work in the, um, the source language and the target language are the same. So um, this is what they're used to. 
Um, and if you're going down the route of an internal DSL, this is usually what you would do. Um, but again, as said, so you have a lot of potential issues um, if you encounter something that cannot be expressed in the language you're using as a host language. Um, or if you want to restrict the host language in a certain way. Um, so technically, it's just more challenging, I think, than devising a new language. Um, and ideally, you would be able to understand the whole of the program, so not just the parts that are um, that are specific to the DSL, um, but also everything around that, and use that to manipulate more of the application of the source code than just a single kernel. Um, we've seen in practice some source-to-source -source approaches, um, such as the Claw compiler from Switzerland, um, that replace the sort of just pragmas with, let's say, open ACC pragmas. So this is not too different to, to what I've been showing. Um, but of course, this is a very limited scope. And if you go beyond that and try to think about how you would implement um, more complex optimizations, such as data layout transformations, um, loop fusion um, on a larger scale, um, maybe inlining of operations to promote loop fusing or splitting, then this gets more and more complicated. And in the end, um, it's not really domain specific anymore because you need to understand everything the framework does. And if you're thinking about C++, especially for the newer standards, then you need to be able to understand a lot of code. So that being said, it has pros and cons. And if it's a good fit to um, whatever you're trying to do, then go for it. It's not enough. <laughs> Okay, if there is no more questions, uh, we can have a short break. Uh, before, um, I guess uh, it was recommended to send your, your personal uh, information to, to Thomas for the tutorials. So if you haven't done it, please do. Um, the required information uh, has been sent by email. So in case you, you can't find this email, uh, I can remind you, uh, we need uh, the type of ID, a number of ID, and uh, the country where the ID was done. Am I correct, uh, Thomas? I guess so. Yeah, that's correct. Thanks. Thank you. So thank you again, Sebastian. Thank you. Um, and so now we can have a 30 minutes break and we meet again. Uh, I, don't know, I don't remember exactly what was the official time. Uh, normally we should meet again uh, at uh, 4.15. So le le let's meet again around, the, around this time. So in more or less 20 minutes. Hello again, hello Marcus. Hello. So again, we can, I think we can jump into the hands on session. Yeah, so I share my screen. I hope you can see everything. Yes. Perfect. So, um, hello. Then I think um, I will start with the presentation. Okay, um, so my name is uh, Markus. I'm uh, also from the University of uh, Erlangen-Nürnberg and I'm a, a PhD student at the uh, Chair of um, System Simulation. I started um, about a half a year, half and a year ago um, and my main applications are basically solving um, uh, phase field simulations, so multi-phase flows with high Reynolds numbers and um, also um, high density ratios. 
And uh, besides that, uh, I focus a lot on code generation techniques and performance modeling. And uh, therefore, I give in today an introduction to PyStencils and uh, CanCraft, PyStencils for the code generation, CanCraft for the performance modeling. And these two, do, uh, two uh, tools can be combined. And um, I will show you how to do this. Um, and also, this is um, accomplished, uh, accomplished by uh, some exercises which I will uh, then introduce in the uh, course of this presentation and that, uh, that you can also solve uh, something on your, uh, for yourself and also that you uh, test things out and uh, try to get familiar with uh, what I'm talking about. Um, so by now you should have access to the um, Jupyter Hub. And um, if you look at that, I hope this uh, looks something uh, somehow similar than uh, for my account so that you have like a folder which is called performance engineering and code generation. And when you click on that, then you can find uh, the main notebook, which is basically the presentation I'm giving. So everything I'm uh, presenting today is uh, quite interactive and um, I've built it just into a notebook which uh, can be modified and you can like follow the course uh, with this notebook and then also modify some uh, variables and play around uh, during the talk. And there's also then the uh, exercises, which is in which are in the exercise folder. Uh, I have prepared three exercises, and um, basically, I um, would like to tell you that it's um, if you want to do then uh, uh, these exercises on your own, and it's not a good idea that you click on like um, second exercise before solving the first one because it has kind of the solution uh, of the first one and also in the main presentation there are slides which are called slides which are called exercise and um, if you read after those then you can uh, find part of the solution which uh, is in the exercise um, okay um, to ensure that everything runs uh, just fine there is like this one notebook which is called um, which is called install packages and uh, basically it contains one cells uh, one cell which is called test if everything is installed now uh, if you um, run this cell it should run through if not then you need to run the other uh, three cells above um, which uh, basically install cancuff pi sensors and then uh, another package needed by cancuff and uh, with that i think everything should uh, work fine okay um and then let's st uh, start with the presentation. So um, as I said, uh, the focus now today is on uh, PySensors for code generation and CanCraft for performance modeling. And uh, for, uh, for that, I've, um, my main goal to, uh, for this talk is to give you an overview of uh, code generation with PySensors and also solve a simple problem. So I have uh, uh, pre prepared a simple diffusion equation. Basically this results again in a stencil code, which uh, should be, uh, uh, which you should be quite familiar right now because it was, this is quite similar to what was said in the talks before. And uh, also um, then uh, with this uh, diffusion equation example, um, we will start to develop a basic understanding of uh, CanCraft and learn how to couple it with PySensors and then also uh, how to predict performance of the diffusion equation which we implemented or which we generated before. And um, since we then have the performance modeling capabilities on our side and we have the uh, code generation capabilities on our side, we combine these two in a third um, objective of this course, which is then improving the performance of this 2D stencil and then play around a bit and um, see the effects which occur. Okay, so without further ado, um, I will start with an introduction to Pi stencils. So basically Pi stencils um, is a code generator to generate um, C++ code, and it does this from a rather, um, so it, it does this inside PySensors and it does it from a rather uh, um, abstract uh, representation because it uses SymPy. So the idea is basically to use SymPy as an algebraic toolbox, represent our problems in uh, SymPy, as, so in this algebraic toolbox, because then we have the, the, the power of um, simplifying the maths and playing or um, 
uh, basically we have a, 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 a complete algebraic toolbox which we can use to simplify and uh, modify our uh, mathematical description. And um, these modified or, or, or this uh, mathematical description then um, can be used to directly generate C, uh, C++ or, open, uh, or CUDA code. And also um, it is possible to generate um, OpenCL uh, code out of that. So we can use uh, basically uh, CPUs, uh, NVIDIA GPUs, and uh, OpenCL to also enable AMD uh, GPUs, but also there will be uh, in, the, in the near future a, a specific backend to target uh, rock M for AMD. And uh, on the CPU side or on the um, parallelization side, we can do uh, OpenMP parallelization on a single node. And uh, we can also um do multiple uh, we can also generate so basically we cannot directly generate uh, mpi communication but we can com uh, generate the information which is needed for a um let's say uh wrapper uh, around mpi um to take this information and then um uh, communicate the values which was which we have uh, uh, which we tell Basically, the the, the, the wrapper uh, need to uh, be communicated, and uh, the main applications of uh, Pi stencils, of course, as the name success, is um, uh, stencil code. So uh, finite differences, finite volumes, or um, the lattice Boltzmann method. And for the lattice Boltzmann method itself, um, we use not Pi stencils itself, but we use a um, package which sits above um, Pi stencils, and this is uh, called LBM Pi. Okay, um, so to give you an overview, uh, basically with Pi stencils we have a uh, we build up a symbolic representation in our uh, in SymPy, and uh, from this symbolic representation we can generate uh, compute kernels. So we build up a um, us representation of this uh, of this um, symbolic representation. I can I will go into more, more detail later and show you an example with that. And uh, from uh, this us representation, we can uh, generate compute kernels. So basically, when we have this, uh, when we think about this Jacobi example from before, then this uh, sweep, so this nested for, uh, for loop, is then such a compute kernel. But we can also generate boundary conditions for that. So like Neumann boundary conditions or directly boundary conditions to um, yeah, deal with our domain borders. And uh, also, um, as said before, we can have like uh, communication uh, patterns or, or we um, generate communication for um, periodic boundary conditions, but also for intranode uh, communication, we can generate uh, information about which values need to be um, communicated and uh, from the backend side we have like uh, basically oh, we, we can basically just uh, generate plain c++ code and uh, compile it with c, uh, gcc or with intel compiler or clang but we can also generate code for um, llvm so for uh, so for the um, intermediate representation of llvm and then uh, use LLVM for additional optimization steps, which can be uh, combined with the representation. On the GPU side, we can enable, or we, we are able to generate CUDA code and also um, OpenCL code. And now the code we have, uh, we, we generate, we can, so that's the nice thing of, of Python is that we have, uh, that we can now um, uh, basically print these kernels, which we generate into wrapper classes and then um, call these from larger um, frameworks. So in our case, we use the uh, MPI. Um, so the MPI distributed uh, or the, the massively parallel uh, framework Valbola, and we can generate then the, the kernels, the boundary, condi uh, boundary uh, conditions or the um, MPI communication information into Valbola and then use Valbola to run it on um, supercomputers on a large scale. But we can also use Pi stencils to uh, generate code, uh, so to generate code from uh, also from C++ and then call it from Python. So this is what we do today. So we basically interactively uh, call our code then from uh, Python itself. Okay, so uh, first things first, let's start with the fundamentals. 
So um, a first thing which um, we want to do basically is import PyCensors. So for that, there is uh, provided this um, uh, PyCensors.session imports uh, star, uh, which basically implement, imports PyCensors, a lot of um, uh, important PyCensors uh, functionality, and also SymPy and NumPy and um, matplotlib for, for plotting. Um, you can, of course, import all these packages um, yourself, but to get started and to get things uh, or, to, or to check things out really quickly, I think this is the best way to go and also for the, for the uh, notebooks very suitable. And um, then, uh, then uh, basically SymPy is the working horse of PySensors. So uh, first we need some, uh, we need to define some symbols. And uh, maybe uh, some of you are familiar with that right uh, right now or yet. Um, but what you can do is basically you use uh, SymPy. So um, SP is then uh, stands for SymPy, which is imported as SP. And you can then, um, um, yeah, you can then create objects which are uh, called uh, symbols. And uh, what we do now is create an object uh, for X and an object for Y. And as you can see, this is then um, a, a simple symbol. And um, with these objects uh, or, or with these symbols, we can do basically um, basic math. So as I said before, you can now define like uh, this equation and um, play around with it. So what do I mean with play around? I mean, for instance, we can simplify it. So we can call SymPy simplify, and then um, we have um, simplified this equation in a, uh, uh, first of all, more readable form, but also we have only uh, now one X. To, uh, so we have only uh, one X, which gets squared and not uh, two powers. And um, things like that will help us when we generate code, uh, when we finally generate the code later, that um, we reduce overhead significantly because um, if we, for instance, would call or, or would evaluate this expression right as it is above here, then we would, for instance, uh, evaluate the power two times and the power is not that cheap. So um, it is a good idea to bring it in a simplified form which has less, uh, less flops and also less um, of these um, expensive um, calculations inside. Okay, and um, this SymPy, um, so the, the SymPy expression, as I showed before, can be represented, uh, represented in an abstract syntax tree. So what do I mean with that? I mean that uh, basically when we um, look at it, we find, um, so I think I might go uh, back to illustrate this a little better. So on the upper level, we have this multiplication of X squared times this um, expression in the brackets. And then this can be uh, represent represented as a tree structure uh, downwards. So we have um, our multiplication above. Then we have like a, this multiplication uh, consists of two arguments. One is uh, again, uh, or, or both of them are again um, expressions. So one is like the power and um, the power has uh, two, or the, the power function, which has two um, arguments, X and two. And the other is the add function, uh, which has uh, three arguments, arguments because it adds six X and Y. And uh, yeah, basically then this, tree structure allows us uh, for allows us to um, do simplification and to uh, manipulate also this uh, um, uh, manipulate the expression and that's what uh, we are um, what we want to do and that's what is important for us so um, yeah basically as i said before um, to uh, make use of this tree structure we can uh, use the um, function expression func, which gives um, back the uh, node, the, so the, the, the current node for, of the expression, which is multiplication. This was what uh, set on top. And also uh, expression arc, which gives us then um, these two expressions, so x to the power, and also x plus y plus six. Okay, and now um, the basic concept of uh, pi stencils, or the, the basic concepts is to introduce 
something which is called um, fields. So um, basically what we do, uh, what we define is uh, a basic data structure and um, this can be done by calling uh, fields. So in this case, we uh, introduce or we allocate or so basically nothing is allocated yet. For now, we have just a symbolic representation which uh, represents a, um, a field which um, then in the later course of the uh, program flow um, it can be filled with data. So for now, we um, create a symbol which is um, uh, which is uh, the double uh, for the for the um, uh, type, and also it is uh, a two a two D, a two, two D symbol, and it holds uh, two values in each cell. So basically, this can be a um, velocity field. So we have on in each cell of our domain, we have the x and y direction of our velocity. Therefore, we need uh, two, uh, two two indices or, or two values in each cell. And um, with these, uh, so so this field object or this this field symbols basically uh, consists of a spatial and an index dimension. So uh, the spatial dimension is basically stands for the cells, and the index dimension for the number of uh, values which are stored in each cell. So if we look at this uh, closer, we can see. Uh, so we can access, uh, for instance, the right neighbor. Uh, so that the, the, the first uh, value of the cell right to the center cell by calling source uh, from uh, one, do, uh, one uh, comma zero and then specifying the index direct uh, the index dimension as uh, the first value. And then we can see down below we have this uh, field access. Okay, and uh, for these fields. We can define update rules, um, which can then be um, applied and uh, or which can then be uh, generated for um, uh, yeah, low level code in the end. So for instance, when we have um, when we introduce another field, basically the uh, uh, basically the same field, but just with a different um, name, um, we can define that the destination field gets updated so the, the center, um, the center, uh, the center cell of the destination field, for from this center cell, the zero index gets updated by two times the source uh, field, and from that the uh, zero index. So, um, um, as we can see, then uh, um, uh, um, down below we have this representation of our assignment, or basically an equations, if you want. So, so. Um, this defines how we update uh, one uh, symbol or yep. So basically it defines how we update an, a symbol. And um, so this uh, G um, with spatial index zero zero and index uh, zero is nothing else than a special specialized SymPy symbol. And um, so this basically completes the basic concepts of PySenses and from that we can start to solve some problems. And the first problem I have brought to you today is basically solving a 2D diffusion equation. So um, this is uh, represented here above in um, yeah, as a PDE, uh, just simple as you would write it down in like a um, yeah, uh, in a book or in some um, mathematical form. And um, we want to solve it now. So to solve this um, equation, we can use a simple five point stencil and um, with ex explicit time stepping. And from that we can uh, derive, so I won't go into detail how to derive that, but in the end you would end up or you could end up for a very simple uh, scheme to solve it. So also only for the purpose of this course, it's not like I would uh, solve it in the, uh, in the in practice with actually the scheme, but just for the course of this, proc uh, of this, of this um, uh, for the um, purpose of this course to illustrate how we uh, could define update rules. Um, basically we can derive this uh, form down here, which is like a, a five point stencil and uh, has its direct um, neighbors, uh, has only direct neighbors as uh, access. Okay, um, 
So first things first, we need to implement uh, import uh, time just for measuring then uh, performance later on and also a simplification strategy, which I talk about more later. And um, with that, we can then define our uh, domain size, which we where we want to solve our problem on. Um, I have so I have chosen here uh, 128 and times 128, so a, a simple or a small 2D uh, domain. Um, we use a time step size of 0 0.0112 and a diffusion coefficient of um, 1.2. Uh, from that, we can calculate the number of cells. We can define some time steps and uh, allocate print the allocated memory. So this information is also um, important for the um, for later on of the course. But for now, most important thing is that we have defined our domain and some parameters for our simulation later on or for our calculation later on. And um, from that, we can define um, one of the basic concepts of um, PyStencil. So we can create a data handling object. Basically, what a data handling object does, it um, yeah, handles data which is allocated, but also uh, gives you, so it gives the user the symbolic representation of the data, but inside it handles the allocated uh, data. So when we look here, we have um, the data handling created with our domain size, uh, 128 times 128. We have said that we want periodicity on all sides. So in X direction, Y direction, uh, so, or basically north, south, west, uh, west and um, east. And um, we also want to run it on a CPU for now. It is also possible to just define here GPU, then we would uh, generate or then the default target of our data handling object would be GPU. And all the um, kernel creation can then be um, called with the default target and will be, um, or, and will generate GPU code. But for now, this is, uh, for, but for the purpose of this course, we will only limit ourselves to CPU. Okay, and uh, then we can introduce basically the source and the destination vector or the symbols for that. So this is done with uh, data handling at array. And um, basically this gives back the exact same symbol as we have uh, seen before. So it, we, will have, we will get back a source symbol and a destination symbol. But additionally, we define a bit more information. So we define, for instance, that this uh, vector, when it is initialized, it should be aligned, that we would, we would, uh, we would like to have one ghost layer, uh, and that we would, for instance, use uh, double precision as a data type. And when we call then data handling fill, this, um, uh, this vector is actually um, allocated with the um, defined uh, require or with the requirements we have defined above here. And uh, the same can be done then for our destination. Okay, and um, with these um, data, uh, so, so with our, um, so we have initialized data, so now we can, um, or we have allocated data, so now we can initialize it. So what we do now is um, we um, iterate over, so we use, data handling iterate. So basically the data handling can also be uh, MPI parallel or, or it can be, so basically the data handling can be um, distributed on different um, uh, nodes. So we can also use some sort of domain decomposition. This is done by um, using the uh, Python coupling from uh, Valbala. So basically we use a powerful or we use a uh, C++ framework which uh, has all the domain decomposition and MPI communication in, uh, implemented, and we can use uh, we can use this um, C++ functionality from Python with um, a Python cup so with a Python coupling which is implemented in uh, PyBind, and um, from that we can make use again then in uh, PySenses directly. So. Uh, therefore, I wrote here for block in data handling iterate because we could also have several blocks on uh, different uh, nodes. Okay, and um, in this, uh, for each block, we have like a we can get like midpoint arrays of um, uh, of the block, and uh, then calculate. Uh, so basically, what we want to do is we want to initialize 
um, one part of the domain which is one and every, each uh, everything else of the domain is zero. So we have here a, a spherical or a, a sphere which is, lies somewhere and is initialized by one. So when we look at that, we have done something like that or we have done uh, this. So uh, our domain um, is initialized by zero and then we have this one uh, part which is um, initialized by one so that we can see uh, later on that our um, code actually does something. Okay, and now this completes the uh, first uh, introduction to Pi stencils. Um, so, and um, gives us, um, or basically in, um, initializes the first um, exercise. So in the first exercise, the task is to define the update rule for um, for this problem and then run the simulation and check the results. So I will shortly click on the, I will shortly open up the uh, first exercise. So what you find here is basically what I have introduced now. So um, just one second, I think, yeah. So basically the diffusion equation as a reminder, then we have uh, pi stencils uh, imported again. The, um, we have allocated our um, vectors and um, initialized our domain. And now what is missing is the update rule. And this is then the task to um, finish this, uh, finish the update rule. And um, for this, I will uh, basically just, um, I, I will uh, give you three minutes uh, to work on your own and then I will uh, explain the solution and um, walk through the steps um, to get to the solution. Marcus? Yeah? There have been two questions in the chat about um, issues working on that. Um, I will look at this real quick. So the one case with the not received with credentials was uh, fixed already. Um, if there was a question before that, I don't see that in the chat because I joined too late. Okay, so I haven't received the credentials yet. See here. So first, I think we should answer uh, Maximums. Yes, that one I don't see. I just see Kiran Saga. Um, okay, so Kiran says he has the credentials now. Yeah, exactly. So I think um, okay. So then let's focus on Maximums. Just copy paste it again or something. Oh yeah, I can do that. Um, so basically, that's the question. In the part two. So um, basically, there is a, uh, or Thomas, would you answer? Should I give? Um... So uh, basically, yes, you have to log in into Dialog Server first. Um, and uh, then you can start up um, the Juniper notebook there. So uh, and Afterwards, um, you can connect to this uh, started Jupyter notebook from your home server. The, the Jupyter Hub itself is not um, connectable from the outside of the university. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When you say the, um, the dialogue server, you mean uh, specifically the one called uh, dialogue? Dialogue. Uh, no, it's dot... called SSH, uh, SSHPC. Uh, I sent the link around in the, in the credentials mail um, to a web page describing it because you can connect to it via SSH or like 
NX clients. Yeah, there, there are two servers, one called specifically Dialog. Yeah, don't do, use, the, use that one. Look, I, I should use the other. Yeah. CSHVC. In my case, I have to, to, to then connect on Woody to, to really start the Jupyter. I think you can also start it directly on uh, a CSHPC. Not sure about that. But yeah, okay. SSH Woody is a, is a good hint. I tried, but uh, uh, first uh, Jupyter wasn't recognized, and I tried to load Python, but it uh, was not recognized as well. But maybe I, I did it too quickly. But even with the server running, I, I can't connect. I did all the process. Okay, so I think um, for now I would uh, like to start with the uh, giving you the solution if um, there are no issues anymore. But at least I uh, got I got the wrong button, fortunately. Okay, but at least I do not see. Oh, there is a one question with the no machine uh, client. Yeah, you yeah, don't need that. Um, this is onto this. Yeah. Yeah, SSH is fine. Um, and then you start it up um, and then you connect from at home again in the second shell um, via SSH and like forward your data to this uh, Jupyter Hub. So that's the description is on the web page. I don't want to copy that in the chat. Seems like too much stuff to copy. Okay, uh, so to start our solution, we would uh, basically um, need a uh, assignment for uh, to define our update rules. So we would call ps assignment, 
And um, basically what do we want to assign to? So we have our destination um, field where we want to assign to the center uh, value. And what do we want to assign to that? So basically when we look at the uh, equation above, we have our source uh, center field. So we can just write uh, source uh, 0.0, .0 um, and plus um, this part here on the, um, on the on the right. So basically we have our um, time stepping size times the diffusion coefficient for the um, spacing we take um, one for now. So uh, this is maybe a bit, bit uh, hopefully this was not um, uh, too hard then for you because uh, I did not define the X I see now, but uh, for the X I would um, take then just one. So basically uh, we can just write the T times D and then times uh, the um, expression on the bracket. So um, our five point stars. So basically um, we use our um, left neighbor plus our um, right neighbor plus the upper neighbor and a lower neighbor or upper neighbor plus the lower neighbor. and minus four times the center again. So let's try, okay, I have to run this again. So you can just do um, restart and run all to uh, run the whole notebook. Yeah, and with that, um, so we have now defined this update rule and now I can show you uh, what it looks like on a symbolic uh, way. So basically I just type update rule and then you can see that um, SymPy has also already applied a lot of uh, simplifications and um, wrote it in a um, yeah, bit uh, simpler form. And uh, this update rule can then be taken and just um, so, uh, uh, put into the create kernel function. The create kernel function then also takes the uh, target again. So here we can. Uh, so here with the data handling default target is GPU. It would compile to GPU. If not, um, uh, so in our case it would. It compiles to um, CPU. And we can actually look at this code. So we can just type in show code and then um, see what this abstract syntax tree. So this us looks like. And when we do that, we can see that we have like here our uh, two new, uh, loop nests and uh, inside the innermost loop we have this body uh, where we define uh, exactly the update rule which was uh, given above. And uh, then to uh, complete our calculation or to complete our problem we have to define somehow uh, periodic boundary conditions. This can be done just by uh, using synchronization function. Um, where we just define, we want to synchronize this uh, source field and um, also uh, again a target. And then we can uh, start our uh, kernel to run, or we can start our calculation, run periodicity, then the kernel, and then again, and then in the end, as mentioned also in the talks before, we have to swap our pointers. So here we have also a high level function to do that. And then in the end, we can see that, um, our simulation or our uh, result looks reasonable. So we can um, see that the periodic boundary conditions seem to work. And also I have built in a little test. So I, I test for the um, conservation of mass. It's not sufficient to uh, show that everything worked uh, right, but I think it gives a nice indication. And for the purpose of this course, it's just fine. So this completes the first exercise. Now I would like to, uh, now I will go on with the um, next part. So basically here yet again, um, the update rule here, I can have also introduced um, a simplification strategy. So add sub expression for constants so that our, uh, that the constants will get moved um, out. They will be pre-calculated 
and then only apply it uh, like twice and not uh, as often as before. This is a simple simplification which the compiler will also do, but um, here I have done it uh, with this uh, high level function. And uh, of course, for very complicated kernels, this will get interested, uh, interesting because then the compiler might fail to do, uh, to see all the um, simplifications which um, uh, we would like to um, introduce in the, in the kernel or which we, we would like to have or which could be made. So to say, okay, then we have the kernel, the, the, the code. I think I go through that real quick because I have done it. I have gone through that before. And um, now what is also an interesting part is, um, so we have now, or we have now basically implemented an update rule for the um, stencil itself. But um, first of all, uh, or before we have, the, uh, we have to derive the stencil. And since we have everything on a symbolic form, we can also um, directly define such uh, discretization techniques. So basically we can define a, or this is what has done in, in PySensor. So we have defined a discretization second order. And also we have um, defined the term of diffusion and the, the, the term of uh, transient. So we can uh, represent this equation quite exactly or, or quite um, uh, quite in the same way as it was um, in the uh, PDE form. So we have it down uh, down here. So the divergence operator of the NAPLA uh, of our source field times 1.2, so times uh, our diffusion coefficient and then plus a transient term. And um, this equation can be directly, so we can uh, define a discretization um, uh, a, a, a discreti discretization for that. So in this case, discretization second order, find a different discretization. We can say the spacing is one and the time step by uh, the time step size is then DT, so 0 0.0, .0 1.2, uh, so 0 0.012. And um, now we can just say discretize this diffusion equation. And we end up with the exact same uh, update rule or with the exact same uh, rule as before. Yet again, we can run that and then um, see um, our result and achieve the same, of course. So this um, ends up this ends the conclusion for the first um, half of the presentation. So basically, PyStencils is a very versatile framework. This allows generating for low low, low level code from a symbolic des description, and due to the dependency on SymPy we can build mathematical description or transformation at a very high level. So for, for, for example, the um, uh, discretization, we find the differences directly. There is also a finite volume backend, which uh, does the same for finite volume discretization. And um, then it is also possible to use it standalone to, uh, 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 to uh, uh, so to use it standalone as we have done here. So we have not left Python at all. We have just basically written Python code uh, in Python and then we could execute it right away. We have, um, and we did not execute Python code, but we executed compiled, um, highly optimized C code in the end. And um, also, this is the big advantage. We can use it to generate uh, kernel code for large projects. So for, for example, for the Valbala project. And um, also, um, two big advantages is that it is easily extendable to build um, high-level modules on top. So for example, the LBMPy package, which um, does nothing else but um, generates um, update rules for the latest Boltzmann method. So we can then on a very high level define how our method looks like, and then it defines uh, how the update rule should look like. And um, it is also easily extendable for the low level backend. So for instance, uh, to, support, uh, to support then um, HIP or vector processors or um, different kind of intrinsics. So um, we can also pr uh, print intrinsics directly in our code and not only x, uh, x86 intrinsics for AMD and Intel, but also ARM intrinsics, which allows us to uh, gain uh, performance on uh, ARM chips. Yeah. Um, okay, and um, now the second half of the talk uh, of this or of this exercise se session will be um, focused on Kerncraft and especially on the uh, coupling between PyStance and Kerncraft. 
And um, therefore we start by including Kencoft in our project. So um, just by importing Kencoft and also importing the Python to Kencoft coupling. Um, yeah, so basically Kencoft is a standalone Python package and um, to use it in combination with PyStencils, we need this PyStencils Kencoft coupling. Okay, um, and in order to use Kencoft, so Kencoft works on a very, very, very low level way. So basically it needs a very clear description of what the machine looks like, which we work on. So it is, uh, needs a uh, machine description file, which consists of basically three parts, the architecture description, uh, description, the cache and memory hierarchy description, and benchmark results for typical streaming kernels. So I will go into detail uh, about all of these, and then uh, in the end also, um, uh, yeah, uh, or basically give you hints how to get to a machine file if you, for instance, go to another machine which uh, where you have not, uh, where no machine file is provided by Kencoft, then um, how to um, create those machine files. So basically um, for this course, so um, when you log into the Jupyter Hub, you will find yourself on a Skylake um, E31 uh, 20, uh, 1240. And um, this Skylake is defined then in the machine file. So, we can look at the execution architect architecture of this uh, machine file. So uh, for, for um, if you're interested, you can also find this machine file in machine files. And um, now uh, we read it in. So in the uh, machine file, you can find the execution architect architecture as described before. And the execution architecture, just uh, to give you a hint of what um, is written there, defines like the model name, for instance. So it's a Xeon CPU uh, with 3.5 gigahertz. It's a Skylake processor. It is one socket, it has four, uh, four cores per socket and each core has two uh, threads. And then you can also see um, how many uh, flops per cycle for basic instructions we get. And um, yeah. As the next part, uh, we have the machine description. So we have here basically defined our L1, L2, um, and L3 cache and um, memory. So what you find here, so the important part is basically you defined here uh, how large is the cache and uh, basically how many bytes per cycle you can get uh, from each cache, cache level to the other. So the performance of the cache and um, uh, the other parts, we won't look into detail in this part, but um, they are also very important for benchmarking because they uh, define something or uh, like uh, how many cache misses uh, or evicts and something like that, which has to be uh, measured beforehand on the machine. And uh, last but not least, we have the benchmarks for the machine. So basically um, we, do not like just use the, this, the, the vendor description on uh, how many, uh, so how um, large the band, a ba a bandwidth is uh, for this architecture, but we benchmark it ourselves to get more realistic results. And for that, um, for this, and basically for, um, yeah, the, the, the most part of the machine file, you can use liquid. And uh, this can be done with li liquid bench. Uh, but also Kencraft wraps Liquid Bench around um, to give you uh, all these uh, tests automatically. So uh, to give you a benchmark, for instance, for the copy kernel, for DexPy, and um, this is then also this is then just done automatically by Kencraft. So you can uh, use Liquid and then run the copy kernel specifically, run the DexPy kernel, uh, DuxP kernel specifically and um, use this output, put it all together to this, uh, to this whole description as here. But you can also just run cancuft, um, uh, basically cancuft and call uh, creates. Um, so basically I, I don't know the function by heart now, but uh, it provides this functionality to uh, run all these um, benchmarks. And then um, with this information, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, create the Kernkraft uh, model and um, so the, the machine description and then um, build on 
towards. So with the machine description, you can build the performance model. And now um, I've talked about the performance model and uh, I will go only very, very shortly into, uh, so I, I will talk about it very briefly because the details are um, more complicated. And um, I think to talk about the performance model in detail or the performance model in detail would be a talk for itself. So um, just as a, a quick overview, um, in Kerncraft we have available basically uh, the ECM model, uh, the roofline model, and um, a bit more. And for the for this course we use the uh, ECM model, so we use uh, this model. And um, what do we uh, what do we do with the model, or what is the basically the roofline model? Basically gives you a um, very or a rather simple. Um, roof lane estimate of how the code performs, but uh, the roof lane model also um, also um, has the assumption that all cache levels are uh, overlapping, and this is not uh, generally true. And the ECM model is therefore a little bit more, or is a bit more um, strict and um, directly measures all data flow uh, or uh, all. Um, data um, flows between the um, uh, cache levels or predicts all these data flows uh, between the cache levels and has uh, the ability to provide a bit more um, uh, a better um, performance model for uh, some cases. And um, the bandwidth gained from the, um, uh, from the main memory to the um, uh, or basically the bandwidth benchmarks um, to define um, the speed between these cache levels or, and also from main memory are uh, provided by, uh, by the liquid benchmark um, or by, by liquid. And um, also one really uh, important uh, difference between those models is that um, for the ECM model, we need to um, simulate cache volumes, and this is done by PyCache Sim under the hood. I think we don't have to worry about it too much, but um, it's uh, it's important to mention it here because this is something which is not necessary for a simple or a simpler roofline model. And on the low level part, we have uh, a Intel uh, architecture analyzer, and for that we can use Yaka, which is provided by Intel, but it's also only uh, it only supports Intel architecture. So uh, for our uh, for um, now we only or we mostly use Osaka, which uh, is also apl applicable for um, ARM and uh, AMD chips. Okay, so now that we um, have our abstract syntax tree and we have basically um, talked about the ECM model, we can use this abstract syntax tree and uh, feed it into the ECM model. Uh, but before that, there are some parameters which need to be uh, feed in. And therefore, um, there is like a parameter object called Kenkov parameters provided by PySenses, which uh, has like default parameters. Um, I will not go into detail about that uh, too much, but uh, two uh, small things. So we use uh, cycles per cache line as a performance uh, for performance measurement. Um, I will also um, then calculate this to um, um, let aside updates per second uh, to be consistent with the previous talks, but basically it's just uh, the unit for performance measurement. And uh, the in-core model is uh, Osaka as defined before that um, we do not use uh, Yaka now in this uh, course because uh, Osaka is more versatile. Okay, um, so basically, to uh, create the ECM model, it is uh, fairly simple. You can uh, just uh, call the PySense's CanCraft kernel. You can feed in the AST, uh, so the abstract syntax tree, feed in the machine model or the machine description, get a CanCraft kernel, and this CanCraft kernel gets feed into the ECM model, uh, also with the machine description and uh, the CanCraft parameters. And we define it with uh, verbos equals one, so we get a bit, little bit more output. And afterwards, uh, when we have created the ECM model, we can analyze it. And basically, this um, is then uh, our second exercise. So I will show you around um, a little bit. 
so just one second again. So um, basically what we have here is um, yet again, a um, so a notebook which defines all the necessary things. Uh, so basically again, our kernel we want to analyze. So the diffusion equation from the first task and uh, the kernel is then created in cell five. And uh, from that, uh, we have created the ECM model. And now the task is um, to look at this ECM model. So basically just play around what it can and what information it gives you. And above I have um, stated a few questions which you can answer uh, to get familiar with. So basically also some questions are like, or, or I think I go through it real quick. So uh, questions which can be answered from the uh, ECM model then is how many flops does the kernel need? There's a very simple question then, or it is a simpler question because it can also be seen from the kernel itself. Um, but then um, how many cycles per cache line does the kernel needs? Uh, then when the, where does the memory uh, come from? So does it come from main memory or do we use CPU cache? And uh, if the data comes from cache, from which cache level does it come from? And when does the kernel saturate if you scale it up with OpenMP? So basically uh, you will then find also a um, prediction on uh, how this kernel behaves when you parallelize it. And the bonus task, uh, is then uh, if you can find hints if the uh, compiler could vectorize the code with Symbian. So again, I will give uh, three minutes and then I will go through these questions and the task. Um, again, in the meantime, I look at the chat whether there were questions. If there is no question, I guess you can continue. I, I must admit that in my case, I'm following what you're doing more than trying to do the stuff because uh, it's difficult to set up uh, the notebook. Um, okay, uh, that's unfortunate. I thought it is uh, really simple, uh, but be, because um, so I, I thought it's really simple to do it this way, but um, yeah, it's always um, big, a bit of a problem to uh, get this done. All uh, that it's easy to set it up in this short time. Yes. Um, okay, so if you have um, no problems with that, I can also go through it right now. Um, yeah. So I think yeah, we also have waited almost three minutes. So I think it's a good idea to proceed. Let's uh, rerun the uh, notebook because uh, to get like the uh, ECM model into um, cache again, or maybe I can, I'm not sure, maybe just look. Ah, yeah, I think I have uh, most of the parts of the solution also in my slides. So um, let's look at the, so the first information as I was asked, I asked for was basically to get the number of flops, the flops from the kernel. And this can be done not by, so this can be simply done just by the Kernkraft kernel. So by the Python, uh, Python interface for that, we uh, um, don't need to do a much, a much analysis. And what the uh, kernel, when we do uh, print kernel info, uh, what we can do is, or what we can see is a, a bit of an overview of our kernel. So we can see um, our loop counters, counter one and counter zero. We can see the offset basically our uh, five point stencil. And in the, in the bottom line, we can see then that um, we have a kernel with um, four addi additions and two multiplications. So we have six flops. Okay, now uh, we use the uh, ECM model. So basically model. So we have called the variable uh, which stores the ECM model model and uh, we can use it or we can call the report function and the report function gives us a lot of information. So first of all, it uh, tells us that we reach uh, 24 cycles per cache line on this architecture. So um, this means that we for eight iterations need uh, 24 cycles um, and with the, um, so yeah, that's basically our performance we achieve. So we can also uh, calculate this in uh, letter set updates, or we can directly say, tell, um, we can also directly tell 
the can cough that it should um, give it to us in data side updates per second. But for now, it's uh, the performance which is predicted by the model. And we can see that this performance is predicted by the sum of uh, 12, 8.2, 0 0.6. And these are the different cache levels. So this is cache one, cache two, uh, so level one, level two, and level three. And we have no data which comes from main memory. So basically, this is uh, the answer to the next question. So we have 120. So we have uh, 128 times 128 data points, and this fits uh, into our level three cache. So um, no memory comes from. Uh, so no data comes from main memory when we do, when we calculate this very small domain. And uh, down below, we can also then see that. Um, this kernel is predicted to saturate at infinite cores. So this basically means that we have only these four cores in this small machine. And uh, for this small four cores, we don't see saturation. If we would run this um, uh, kernel on a, let's say, normal HPC machine with, uh, for instance, 20 cores or, 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 or 40 uh, threads, then we would see that it clearly uh, saturates on like um, 10 or uh, 12 cores, something like that. But um, basically for, so in other words, for these four cores, for this small uh, pr processor, we can see that um, we have no set, uh, so we can not, not see saturation yet. Okay, um, and then a last thing which we can do is basically uh, is we can get, um, I hope I can switch here. So I go here for this, um, um, for the for the uh, tutorial notebook again for the for the exercise notebook, and we can type in model dot um, results. So what we have looked before was a report, and now we look at results. And results give us um, a lot of things. Hopefully it does now. Ah yeah, no, of course. Sorry for that. It's not a function; it's a dictionary, and uh, this gives us. Um, a lot more info, um, a lot more insight. I will not go into detail about everything, but what we can do is uh, we can look at the in-core model output. Um, just uh, call it and uh, print it. And uh, this gives us um, the assembler code of the loop nest. So basically, if we have, uh, so in other words, um, we have not only generated this loop nest, but we have also a lot of boilerplate code, for instance, or in this case, we have a lot of boilerplate code to make uh, to make it possible to call this kernel from uh, Python. And um, if you compile compile this uh, code with uh, to assembler. You would uh, have also the assembler instruction for all the boilerplate for all this boilerplate code, and this is not what we want to um, look at when we want to analyze. Basically, um, so when we basically want to only find out uh, simple things, for instance, whether this code was vectorized or not, and um, so here we have a very uh, nice representation of the assembler instructions here on the right hand side. And we can see that uh, we use this uh, vector add, so uh, we can see that the compiler was able, in this case, to uh, vectorize uh, this uh, simple example, which is expected, I would say. OK. Um, and then uh, let's compare our, uh, let's compare the, the measurements of our code with the prediction of the ECM model. So uh, yeah, I've uh, stated here the uh, to, uh, calculation for to get from um, cache lines per cycle to um, mega loops, so mega letter side updates per second. So basically, we just need the uh, frequency of our machine, and um, then can just um, feed in here the um, performance or so the 24 cycles per cache line, and then uh, have the uh, calculation done. And uh, from that, okay. Um, so, okay, from that, first of all, a few things about uh, benchmarking the kernel. So, um, as before, I have, or uh, above, if you have, um, uh, if you remember, I have created the kernel in Python and then called it from Python and then built around a timing function. 
but this is not what you want when you want uh, when you want to uh, benchmark the uh, the code, because uh, you have a lot of overhead from uh, the Python call, and um, or you can have a lot of overhead from the Python code. Also, you want to run the code uh, pinned, so with liquid pin, so uh, as to uh, come back to the uh, first talk, so that you have a uh, more reliable uh, performance evaluation. And here also we have provided a function called generate benchmark and run C benchmark. And uh, basically what these functions do is um, they generate a small benchmark kernel, which also, or which I can show you here right down. So um, we have uh, basically a, 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 a small code where we also or where we can, when we state liquid equals true, where we can include liquid di uh, directly or where we uh, generate the include into the code, then um, we have our kernel, which we want to analyze. And um, also, if you remember from the first talk, you can uh, you have now liquid uh, marker regions. Um, we have now, we have uh, a region around our loop, um, which is then used to uh, analyze our kernel. And um, if we then uh, analyze our kernel, so this is done on a, or if we benchmark our kernel, so this is done on a uh, Skylake uh, Gold uh, 6148. So it's not the same as uh, we use um, for this course. So don't expect the same uh, performance results, but it's basically uh, the um, objective for today is also to give you a, uh, is only to give you a, a uh, nice overview, but not to actually um, measure exactly these um, values. So what we can see when we measure this uh, and we compare with the ECM model that, um, so what we do measure here is we have uh, initialized the very same the very same problem as before, but we have initialized it on a very large domain. So we have uh, 500 values in Y direction, but in X direction, we have 2 million values. This gives us about uh, 16 gigabytes of memory. And this 16 gigabyte of memory can no longer be stored in uh, the cache. So this, this 16 gigabyte of memory will, um, uh, will be stored in the main memory. And when we just do the, um, a, um, yeah, when we just run this kernel, then we will get this uh, performance on the very last end. So basically right here. And um, what we do now, is we use blocking. So we uh, just block for the uh, for the large X direction and um, we um, decrease or basically, uh, yeah, when we uh, go from the very large, so from the naive implementation then to um, small blocking factors, we can see that um, exactly as described before, we can draw, we can see then the, the different uh, cache levels which we, drop out uh, in the meantime, or in the, in the course of this um, benchmarking. And uh, when we compare this against the ECM model, we can see that uh, we follow the ECM model quite well. So uh, especially this uh, point here is uh, shown quite well, but here on the um, left side, we have like a, a larger deviation. And now this is what I, what is, uh, most important for me for this call for for this talk is that uh, this is now a very important point to look at. Um, so because here we can ask ourselves why is this deviation? And um, I think, or maybe one reason might be because um, for the preparation of this course, I have just done exactly that what I have um, what I have uh, told you before that I have just created the kernel for uh, Python and called it from Python, but I have not generated actually a uh, C code, a low level C code. And I think in this uh, very small region, we have then effects which uh, come then also from this uh, uh, problem. So this might be one explanation, but uh, in the end, uh, this is a region where we have to look at and where we, uh, where we, where our performance model gives us a really, really high benefit because we can indicate this region. Because if we would not um, have this performance model, or if we would not use Kernkraft, we would not even see that um, we have here this uh, problem or this deviation from a uh, prediction of the kernel. Okay, and um, what I have also um, marked here in this um, 
uh, graph is the uh, layer condition. So uh, as it was introduced by um, Thomas in the first talk, so I have uh, marked those here and uh, uh, here. Oh, I've, sorry for that, um, but uh, maybe you can see this vertical lines. And um, these layer conditions, um, as stated before, so I think just to give you a, um, oh yeah, just to give you a, a small reminder. So um, basically we have the problem that um, we um, loop through our domain and we um, um, propagate with our stencil further. So we have uh, propagate from left to right in this case. Um, in, in this direction. And um, what we can see is that we have certain values. So imagine that these white cells are a bit more so that this is a very large domain. And we can see that we have still some values in cache on the right side. But when we move forward, we can see, uh, uh, but when we move forward, um, new values have to be loaded into cache because uh, the stencil uh, asks for new values and does the compiler or the, does the hardware um, deletes old values. And this is done right here. So basically this line is deleted, but um, uh, at some point the stencil will also be back again at this region. And then we have to load it again. And this we want to, we want, we would like not to do, but uh, we would like to have um, blocking. So uh, for instance, uh, so as indicated here. So when we block here on the screen, uh, line, then we can see that we will use way more um, values right uh, from the cache as before. And this is a uh, optimization, which is uh, quite important for stencil codes. And uh, now the layer condition um, to come back ag again to, to what was said before, highly depends on the stencil and thus highly depends on the kernel. So it's not that simple in uh, every case to um, calculate this layer condition. And also you, maybe you don't wanna uh, do it in every case. So um, uh, uh, here again, KernCuff provides us a very useful tool because it has the model layer condition and uh, layer condition can be called for the KernCuff kernel. You can also uh, give in the, or we, we have to give in the machine description again and the parameters, and then uh, we analyze, um, and then we can have uh, the predicted uh, so we have a prediction for layer conditions for each cache level. So for instance, to fit uh, the data into L1 cache, we have to, um, so we have 128 and 128 is the domain size right now. So we have uh, A times uh, A for the domain size, which is um, 16,384. And um, this drops out from uh, L1 cache. So basically the L1 layer condition is not satisfied. And the uh, L2 um, layer condition is almost satisfied. So basic, so when we um, think about uh, what we have, uh, what was stated before, then there's no safety margin now. So uh, typically when we run this problem, then we would see that there are some values which drop out of L2 cache. This was also indicated by the ECM model, if you uh, remember uh, from before that we had like a, a small amount of uh, of data which came from L3 cache. This is because we have no uh, not used the safety margin now. So also the uh, L2 cache is uh, the L2 layer condition was um, um, not fulfilled in uh, partly, but the L3 cache uh, layer condition was fulfilled quite well. And uh, this comes to our last exercise. Um, so the last exercise would be now to um, basically um, uh, apply the layer condition or uh, um, play around with that. So just one second. Yeah, so basically we have uh, exactly this uh, problem now um, allocated. So we have a um, very large domain so that uh, our um, memory does not come from um, from the cache, but from um, from main memory. And um, what we can do now, because uh, we have our uh, code generation uh, tool chain, we can apply simple um, optimizations like the um, CPU blocking directly on a high level and then um, uh, print the um, additional loops directly into the kernel. So, um, 
yeah, I would also say three minutes about uh, for that if you wanna uh, do the exercise. But if you also, uh, but if you all of you say that um, I would should just um, talk about it, then I can also proceed. Marcus, how much time do yep. you need to finish the exercise? Um, after that exercise, it's a conclusion and then it's uh, done. So basically, that's the last exercise and then we're finished with the talk. Okay. So yeah, I think I'm a bit... Um, over time uh, yet, so uh, my, uh, maybe it's a good idea to uh, start with the um, to start with the evaluation. So um, what we can do now, as I said, um, so we can apply here like a, a blocking size. So for instance, two twenty four uh, in x direction and y direction zero. And uh, when we do so uh, and generate our kernel, we can see um, that our kernel has um, an additional loop inside. Um, I hope this works now. But I see, I uh, yeah. So we have an additional outer loop here um, in the kernel, and this is um, with uh, blocked with one uh, twenty-four values, and. Um, yeah, and when we run this um, kernel, so basically I, or let me just uh, run it real quick. And then let's uh, see about the performance. Okay, so this uh, takes a bit of a time, but um, so we have now uh, about uh, 1000 M loops, uh, mega lattice side updates. And when we generate the kernel then uh, completely without uh, the blocking, so we have only these uh, two nested loops and then run it, then it would take a bit longer. And it takes only, it gives us only 660 M loops. So we can see that um, basically without, um, or the way we can see that without um, applying blocking, um, our um, kernel gets uh, significantly uh, less performant. And um, yeah, what we what we could do, could do now, and uh, you could also uh, then do this. Um, so the notebooks and all the um, um, yeah all the exercise uh, so, so the exercises and the um, presentation are provided with this course. So you can also then um, look at this then later on, and uh, you can what we, what you would see is that if you apply this layer condition predicted by uh, Cancuff, then you can see these effects um, about that the um, kernel gets um, yeah, slower and slower if you um, violate more layer conditions. Okay, and this um, brings us to the conclusion. So uh, to conclude here, performance modeling is a complicated task. That's why tools such as Cancuff are absolutely essential because uh, they give you insight into what's going on in the uh, or give you a, a prediction of what's of, of for your kernel um, for uh, many different architectures and also for uh, or for all architectures and also for um, different kernels. So if you have, um, uh, uh, so if you, for instance, um, do not apply a second order finite difference, but a fourth order finite difference, you would get a completely different kernel. And thus uh, you have, you would need to start with the performance modeling uh, com uh, from, from scratch maybe, or uh, well, not from scratch, but uh, uh, from uh, the beginning, uh, so to say. And uh, therefore, Kencroft helps a lot. And 
with only without uh, performance modeling, it's only hard to realize whether a code reaches good performance. And um, so basically, you might think that the code performs well, but uh, when you have not uh, applied a um, suitable performance uh, prediction to the uh, code, you might end up that um, the code, in fact, does not perform very good, but it performs uh, rather poorly. And also, um, what is really important is that um, uh, yeah, bad code always scales. So um, a lot of people they start with uh, large problems. They uh, measure like they measure for for instance the um, uh, parallel uh, efficiency and things like that. But the first things you need to do, or which is very essential, is that you start on a very low level on a single core, optimize that, and then uh, scale up the, the code because um, uh, a lot of effects uh, which um, uh, lead, uh, which uh, show, uh, which bad code shows um, are not really good to indicate when you have large uh, a large problem. And um, due to the abstract level of Pi sensors, um, it is easily possible to um, combine the abstract representation of um, our uh, mathematical description with the performance modeling um, toolbox uh, with the performance modeling uh, package CanCraft, and just give a very powerful um, combination. So thank you very much for your attention and um, if you have any questions left then please feel free to ask So at the moment, I cannot. Um, ju just a quick question. Um, here, you, you are mainly focusing on um, an Intel CPU core. Yeah. Um, is it is it something that has been done as well on, uh, for instance, GPU uh, working thread or? Uh, yes. So uh, it is also possible on uh, AMD and uh, ARM architecture. So we. Um, there is uh, uh, the performance performance modeling available, and we can also generate uh, code for that uh, very easily. Uh, for GPUs, um, there is not uh, there is basically the uh, performance modeling uh, toolbox, or to say, CanCraft for GPUs is, um, if you want to say it like that, then it's uh, in development at the moment. Okay. No more questions from the audience? And from the pod, I will just check if there's something. So unfortunately, I cannot open the chat right now. I will st uh, stop the sh sharing the screen. Maybe then I can, yeah, now I can come back to the overview. Okay. But no, we, it seems that we don't have questions in the, in the pod. Okay. okay, looks good. So in this case, uh, thank you very much, Marcus, for this last uh, presentation. So thanks for having me. And uh, thanks to the to all lecturers today for for participating, for for teaching us uh, your tools. Uh, so we'll meet again tomorrow for for the first session about StarPU, and then in the afternoon we'll have the linear algebra presentations. So I wish you a good evening and see you tomorrow. Bye, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Good evening. Thanks. Good evening. Bye. Bye. Bye.